Uh, good morning. We'll call the meeting to order. We respectfully acknowledge that the township of Algonquin Highlands is located on Treaty 20 Mishi Saugig territory and in the traditional territory of the Mishi Saugig and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations. We also acknowledge a historical shared presence of other Indigenous nations throughout the area. We recognize these original inhabitants as the stewards of its lands and waters since time immemorial. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to approve the agenda? Councillor Short Reed, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Moved by Councillor Shortry, second by Deputy Mayor Dayu. Be resolved that the April 20th, 2023 Council meeting agenda be approved as circulated. All in favor? That's carried. And could I have a mover and a seconder to approve the minutes of April the 6th? Sorry, I know that's out of order. Deputy Mayor Dayu, Councillor Shortry. Moved by Deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councilor Shorey, be resolved that the April 6, 2023 meeting minutes be approved. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, does anyone have a declaration of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Deputy Mayor Dayu. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I declare a conflict of interest on uh, items 8, B, e, and C, as I own a property very close to an upcoming project. Thank you. Any other declarations? Councillor Short Reed. Thank you. I have no specific remarks today and we have no public meetings so we'll move right into delegations and this morning we're welcoming um, President and CEO Cheryl Harrison and Board Chair Maureen Miller uh, from the Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare Unit. So welcome and please join us. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, and good morning to everyone. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today at Council. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to bring you an update on our capital planning redevelopments at the hospital. My name is Maureen Miller. I'm the chair of Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare uh, Board of Directors, and with me is President and CEO Cheryl Harrison. Uh, the board's vice chair, uh, Dave Uffelman, is also here today in the gallery. Um, our, our, our vision at Muskoka Algonquin Healthcare to reimagine healthcare, um, local hospital healthcare close to home is becoming cl closer and closer to reality. Um, today, local leaders have been especially. Um, do we have, oh, do we have the presentation? Sorry, I'm sorry. Do we have our slides? And these, oh, there. This is when you need eyes in the back. Oh, I, okay. Sorry, I just realized I was going to do that thing where you get ahead of your slides and uh, <laughs> sorry, get caught there. Great. Oh, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. Um, to date, um, local leaders have been really, really supportive of uh, the work that we're doing, and we're optimistic optimistic about ongoing support across Muskoka, East Parisand, and in, in the Algonquin Highlands area. Um, and this is regarding our community's local share of, of building the two new hospitals. So what's been approved? Uh, so we're, we're thrilled to announce that uh, uh, one project to build two sites in uh, one in Huntsville on the existing land at 100 Miller, uh, Frank Miller Drive, which can accommodate a new build, and in Bracebridge on new land um, through a site selection process that we'll give you an update on today. So I'm now going to hand it over to Cheryl, and she's going to fill you in on some of the, the specific details. Thank you, Maureen. Next slide. 
Um, so we always start off with uh, answering some questions that we've heard from the communities early on is why do we need uh, uh, new hospitals? So this is, I think a picture uh, says a, a lot more than the words do, but uh, this is our emergency department in Huntsville. As you can see, we've got stretchers in the hallway. We've got people laying, uh, waiting to be offloaded from ambulances. So, um, you know, this is probably as we called hallway medicine at its best. Next slide. Um, these are some air, other um, areas of our hospital um, where we, you can see the aging infrastructure. Um, this is uh, a challenge, obviously, for working day to day, but it's also a challenge when we're trying to recruit uh, new healthcare professionals to our hospital. Next slide. This is the ministry's approach to capital planning. And as you can see there, we're at um, stage 1.3, which is called functional programming. And uh, we are happy to announce that we're gonna be ready to submit that proposal um, by January of 2024. Uh, there are a number of components and I'll go to the next slide, please. There's three components actually for stage 1.3. One is that you have to create a functional program. And this is where we've had a lot of stakeholder engagement. We look at our data projections and then we come out with um, different models for different areas of the hospital. So for example, emergency departments, we have stakeholders at the table. We uh, take a look at data. We decide what's working now and what's not working and what we want for the future. And we have about 16 of those user groups for um, many of our clinical areas as well as non-clinical areas. Um, so staff, uh, staff engagement and community engagement is also very important as part of our submission to show that we've listened, we've learned, and we've adjusted our our programs and planning. And of course, developing a financial financial plan for a, a project of this size. And I'll talk a little bit about what that what's entailed in that. And then the other piece that has to be submitted is our site selection for Bracebridge, which I'll touch on as well today. Next slide. Um, this I'll just um, probably skim over as well. This is about our user groups. Um, and it's really important to have the expertise of our our healthcare professionals, but is more importantly from our patients and families who use the services today and into the future. Next slide. Uh, these, these discussions are not easy, as you can imagine, because we, we want to be able to build our future hospital with two sites, making sure that we're doing the best we can as efficiently as we can, and to have two sites that are sustainable. So these user groups are having courageous conversations about what, what we want, what we don't want. Next slide. Funding the project, um, as I'm sure many of you know, the government does not pay um, for 100% of uh, the costs related to equipment furnishing. They do pay 90% of the build, but in terms of the rest of the local share, uh, we have to pay for 10% of the remaining costs for construction, and we have to pay for 100% of the costs associated with hospital equipment furnishing and any land that we have to purchase as well as servicing that land. Uh, our community's uh, share involves uh, the District of Muskoka, ourselves as a hospital, we, we have some assets, so that will be going into the local share. And then, of course, we have two very active uh, foundations that will be doing capital campaigning for it, as well as our communities. So district and area municipalities, not only just the, the municipalities in Muskoka, but we've also had um, uh, communities in East Perry Sound who make MAC their home hospital step up to the, the plate as well to support us. Next slide. Uh, this, uh, get this, this is what we presented back in January to some of our uh, local communities. Uh, we started with a project that was about 560 million with a local share of 129 back in 2019. We repriced that in last year um, to get an idea of what future costs could be. So final costs aren't completely known, but our project right now is sitting at 967 million with a local share of 225 million. So very expensive. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the points that uh, have been impacting uh, the cost for sure. And I don't think uh, any of them are a surprise. So, you know, we're we're trying really hard to, we'll be recosting this project before we do the submission and hopefully see 
um, some reduction in the local share. Next slide. So um, we will be, as Maureen said, we're gonna be building on existing land in Huntsville. We need about 40 acres and the, the current property is uh, sufficient for that. Uh, what, uh, what will be really different is the hospital is gonna uh, move over and where the existing hospital is that will be tearing down will be at grade parking. So if you've been to Huntsville Hospital, it, I describe it as having to be a mountain goat to get into the hospital. <laughs> Next slide. And our South Muskoka Hospital in, uh, site in Bracebridge, it is absolutely landlocked. It's only on 11 acres. Um, so there is uh, no way that we can build on that property. And so we are looking at the site selection. And I'll give you a quick update on that in the next slide. Very, very uh, busy time doing the site selection process. We had about 20 properties that we were reviewing. We got down to the five properties that you see here. Um, the consultants of uh, urban strategies have a list of criteria that they weight. Um, and as a result of that, the, um, the two bottom ones, uh, D and E, have been removed. And we our top three are A, B, and C. And our preferred, and I say preferred because it's preliminary right now, there's still a lot of work that has to go on with doing the, the site evaluation is um, the Muskoka Beach Road site. Next slide. And we are also on a road show this week doing up, uh, updates to our communities. Um, the, the dates are there where um, we've got two virtuals as well. So if there's people in the community that wanna join, um, please, we welcome you to, we wanna hear people's thoughts and uh, I'll turn it over to Maureen to close the discussion. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, we've had the second round of engagement with the communities as well underway. Uh, we've been crisscrossing the catchment uh, for, um, it seems months now, but this week we've been very busy. Um, we would very much uh, uh, offer to you that we, we would love to come and do an open house in your community if you would like that. Um, we certainly uh, didn't mean to uh, not do it, but we weren't sure exactly um, how you would like to approach that. So part of our ask today is if you would like us to come and do an open house in your community to update uh, the residents on what's happening, we would be very happy to do that um, uh, as soon as we possibly can. Um, one of the things that we've had the opportunity to do is through our local share committee, we have been discussing how to raise the $225 million dollars um, we've been overwhelmed by the um, commitment by all the people sitting at the table. That would be um, both of our foundations, ourselves as MAC, the District of Muskoka, and the, the municipalities of Muskoka. Uh, when we started, um, we had not included municipalities in other parts of uh, the catchment area that contribute to, that use the hospital, but are not contributing through it through an assessment process underneath the umbrella of the district. And we were approached by um, the municipalities of uh, East Perry Sound and El Meguen, And they approached us at the public meeting we had there in January. And they said, um, we're not in your catchment, but we would really like to contribute. And we've been quite overwhelmed by their commitment. Um, <laughs> they are serviced by both, both the North Bay Hospital and by the Huntsville Hospital site. And uh, they have stepped up, joined our local share committee, and committed to raising what we believe is a pretty significant part of uh, funding for uh, the residents of their community. Uh, what it's shown us, too, is that we have many, many municipalities in our catchment that don't have very many people. So raising this money is a, is a really, um, a really, it's a big goal and a big target. Um, the, the discussions about local share are going very well and, and we're, we're very confident that we will meet our target. Um, but we did wanna have the opportunity today to ask you if there was a possibility your council would consider um, some contribution to that in the same um, spirit that the Northern uh, Amalgam and, and East Perry Sound uh, communities have been participating. Um, we know that there are other hospitals that service people in your community. You have, you have choices other than Bracebridge and Huntsville, um, but we find ourselves in a situation where we're trying to cross boundaries and, and make sure that everybody gets the right healthcare close to home. Um, so with that, um, 
we'd be happy to answer any questions you have and would be, again, very happy to come to your community and hold an open house. Thank you. Thank you um, a lot uh, for your presentation. I, you know, I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, the challenges that all of our hospitals are, are facing, uh, particularly since COVID, but I think that they, they, uh, they've started before COVID and COVID has just made it that much worse for everybody. And, you know, I, I know that we're all having uh, funding issues, recruitment issues are becoming a, a horrendous challenge. And, uh, and I just want to acknowledge that, you know, the, the work that you're doing and the challenge that you've got ahead of you. Um, I, uh, I, 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 one of the things that I am unsure of is, is the sort of percentage of, of people who visit your hospitals from Algonquin Highlands. And I, you know, I, I know that it would be, a, you know, sort of a more natural thing for people from say Ox Tongue Lake and even some in Dorset to, uh, to utilize your facilities, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know to what extent that that is. The, do you have any kind of numbers or, or, or statistics with respect to that, or, or is that a hard thing to pin down? <laughs> um, it, it is. It is quite a difficult thing to pin down, as we have found out. Um, so, determining how who is using the hospital and how often, um, and I'm going to take a crack at this. Cheryl might kind of correct me. Uh, it's your home address that gets added in with with when you use your health card. So if you are a seasonal resident or a part time <laughs> resident, or if you run a business in the community but live elsewhere, your your um, your postal code doesn't reflect um, exactly where you come from. Uh, so we've been struggling with trying mm -hmm. to actually uh, figure those numbers out too, and. Uh, I guess the, the best example we can give you is the one in, in uh, Almeglin and Burke. We were in Burke's Falls last night and uh, they are actually part of the catchment to the north. And when we ask many of the people that have come out to the, to the public meetings, they have said, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Depending where we are, we go to North Bay or we go to Huntsville, but we normally go to Huntsville. Is that, it's anecdotal, it's not scientific, but we, it has been really difficult to, uh, to identify the actual usage. So did I yeah. miss anything? No, yeah. no, it's, uh, it's difficult. And then of course, all our communities have that uh, increased uh, seasonal uh, population as well, which is almost impossible to, to project. Yeah. yeah, well, especially as, as you say, it all goes according to your postal code and, yeah. and every, Probably half of our population come from the greater <laughs> greater Toronto area. That's right. Um, uh, well, I mean, when I I'm challenged with this because I recognize that we do have people that are that are using your facilities, and and yet we have two hospitals here mm -hmm. in Halliburton County that we're contributing to, and right. and more than I believe we should have to, <laughs> given the where the responsibilities should lie. And I'm sure you you're more than aware of those challenges. Um, and, and we're having some challenges here. Um, and, you know, it just sort of, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. You know, I mean, we, we're all limited as to funds, um, but I, I guess I would look to council to see if they have any questions or comments. Um, and, uh, you know, on the idea of an open house, um, whether we as a municipality contributed or not, uh, of course, that's something that we wouldn't be able to determine until we get into our next budgeting cycle. But, uh, you know, I mean, there may be individual donors uh, that could be, uh, you know, that could be con convinced during an open house or hearing, you know, your presentation that this is something that they would like to contribute to. So I'd like to hear council's thoughts on, you know, an open house. And, and personally, I would like to suggest that the, the further north we can have that open house, probably the better, but we're not really in a position to, to have the space right now, you know, other than here in Stanhope. Um, un unless it's later on in the year and we actually have a Dorset Recreation Center that's that's open open for use. Um, thoughts or questions from Council? Deputy Mayor Dayu. Thank you very much. Um, I represent the northernmost part of the municipality and indeed fall directly within the Huntsville catchment. Um, and the way I often think of it is where emergency services are called out from. So in our area, all the paramedics come from Huntsville. There's no you know, cross and go, no, don't collect $200. They're coming from, from Huntsville. So, and, uh, so for me, I feel like Oxtongue Lake and that general area is, is directly within your catchment. Um, 
I would suggest from Oxton Lake's perspective that we would fall within the Dwight um, community when it comes to community outreach. Okay. Uh, and so I believe that up north, we have been covered already by work that you've done in Dwight. I think it was on the 17th. We were in Dwight on Monday evening. Yes. Right. Yes. So that for me would would be the correct partnership there. Um, in terms of Dorset, I couldn't say, but um, I think we're covered in, in Oxton for that. Questions, comments, Councillor Short Reed. <laughs> And I think Dorset as well falls into the majority of Oxton Lake because the distance Huntsville is closer than Grace Bridgman and Halliburton. Um, but unfortunately, the rec center in Dorset is closed temporarily. Right. So I don't know if the invitations for Dwight got to the residents of Dorset or not. Uh, we had some input from some other municipal representatives to say, oh, you should have been in Dorset. And as you said, we, we did not have a choice on that in terms of facilities. We were uh, juggling a whole bunch of priorities, but um, maybe there's an opportunity to do one in Dorset later on in the summer as we're further on in the process, if that would be helpful. We're at your discretion to... Yeah, well, I, you know, it's it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, we, we have a challenge with our uh, our Dorset Center and, and that won't be resolved until the end of the year. But this is going to be ongoing for a while. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to yeah. be doing fundraising for some time to come. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think we can if if you see the benefit to that, I'm, I'm sure that we can make the facility available for for that, you know, when it's once it's open. Great. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Questions that anyone's got or comments that you'd like to make, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Um, the the one comment that I would like to make is with pride to the for the Dorset community because there has been quite a bit of fundraising locally for the Huntsville uh, Foundation. Mm -hmm. A few individuals there have been really strongly involved in that, and who have brought um, events to Dorset to raise money for the foundation. So I do feel that there is that uh, that connection, that that spiritual connection with the community already, uh, and when when uh, a potential request for a, a community gathering is made for uh, for this project, I think they'll immediately know what you're talking about because that, that conversation is, is ongoing in Dorset. That's great. We also uh, uh, will be attending the Lake of Bays Association Annual General Meeting on July 8th to give them an update. And so with your permission through uh, your clerk, uh, we could keep you updated on uh, ongoing and updated activities and we do uh, we had a number of uh, donors join us on Monday night in, in Dwight and they uh, they had a, a list of questions so it was really encouraging to see their their interest and they asked some great questions and so it it is alive and well um, uh, in that area you might also approach the uh, Kawagama Lake uh, Association um, to see if you could attend their AGM this summer because uh, they there's a, a fair population there and uh, you know i'm sure that there are people that are would would love yep. to be able to uh, to right. help um councillor barry i'm just curious curious question um are either of the hospitals or both of the hospitals planning to have um um a maternity ward currently in halliburton county you cannot deliver a baby so you have to either go to aurelia or Lindsay's. so i just wondered if that's in the plans yes uh we're, we will be continuing to have obstetrics we're, as I said, we're in the user group phase. We're looking at uh, opportunities of how we can do that so that, you know, it's a, we deliver about 300 babies a year. I think there's opportunities to grow that. Um, but again, we have to uh, plan what, where we're doing it and making sure that we've got access for all the communities. Any other questions or comments? Well, let's just keep open lines of communication uh, and and see what we can do to to support your efforts Great. while trying to continue to support our own office yes. here. <laughs> um, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the delegation? Councillor Short Reed, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Thank you. If you could, don't run off until we've passed our resolution. <laughs> Moved by Councilor Short, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dayu. Be resolved, Council received a delegation for information from President and CEO Cheryl Harrison and Board Chair Maureen Miller of Skokie Algonquin Healthcare regarding an update on the two new hospital projects. All in favor? That's carried. Thanks so much.
Okay, our next delegation is uh, Jason St. Pierre from the Eastern Ontario Regional Network um, to speak to the cell gap project and the uh, um, which ties in with the proposed uh, tower in Oxon Lake. All right, can you hear me? Good morning, Jason. How are you? Good morning, Madam Mayor. I'm fine, thank you. That was a great presentation from the uh, the hospital team. I, I thought we had challenges trying to find funding for cell gap coverage until I listened <laughs> to that. And I think uh, our, our cycle's been pretty quick to find some funding, so. There you go. Well, yeah. uh, over to you and uh, welcome to Algonquin Highlands. Well, thank you. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, quite in the cards this time, but I'm hoping maybe next time I will actually be able to be up there in person to meet with the staff and uh and the elected officials. So thank you for taking the time. We are going to go through uh, an update on the Eastern Ontario Regional Network Cell Gap project for the team. Uh, if there's any questions at any point, I do have a you know, slide at the end that says questions, but if there are questions throughout, uh, I am uh, open to having those discussions throughout this, this, this uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if the, I believe we sent the presentation over yesterday. I don't know if you can see it. You got the new. The, yeah, the, the new one. Yep. You can the see new it. The new improved version. The, definitely the improved version, yes. You can see it, sorry? Yep. Okay, I just, I can't, oh, here we go. There we are. Okay, perfect, thank you. So maybe just on the uh, the agenda, um, quickly, just for the group here today, I don't know if I'm, Driving this. Oh, there we go. So on the agenda, we just have the uh, an update on the overall cell gap project across eastern Ontario, as well as for Algonquin Highlands. And if there's any questions at the end, um, always my favorite part of these discussions. The next slide, please. No, skip that one too. Now I know why we have 20 slides in these presentations. We have a lot of title slides. So just as a, an overview for the group here on the eastern Ontario Regional Network and the project we're doing. Um, we are looking to close uh, a number of the gaps in today's cellular network across Eastern Ontario. To do so, um, we have a very, very aggressive strategy and target to be able to deliver this by the end of 2025. Um, as an overview for the project, we're, we're um, sorry, excuse me, sorry, approximately 312 existing sites will be upgraded across Eastern Ontario to support the LTE, which is the voice applications, as well as, uh, as 5G. Currently, we've completed about 297 of those, so um, you know, doing very well in that space to get the cell sites upgraded. We have approximately 260 brand new sites that will be built across Eastern Ontario. 13 of these are completed now and in service. We did have some challenges in the initial kickoff to the sites, and I will get into that a little bit later as far as uh, the ability to secure lands and some of the duty to consult processes that were passed along by the Crown to East Ontario Regional Network to, um, to work on their behalf. We have 74 sites that will be uh, located on existing towers, so co-location, if you hear that term, that's what we're looking at. Uh, this data says there's 15 in service. We're actually, uh, there was a, a rather large push in the end of uh, March to get a number of sites. We're well over 20 sites now that are in service on the co-location space. As mentioned earlier, we are expecting the project to be done by 2025, and that is our contra contractual obligations with the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure. And we will meet or exceed our project goals. The other part that's always uh, important on here is even after the bills are finished and the, the services are um, up and running, we do have a service level agreement in place for five years that we will manage to ensure there's enough capacity being maintained in this network for what we projected as future growth into Eastern Ontario. Um, but if something exceeds there, we are monitoring those SLAs to ensure that, uh, that um, there is enough capacity in the network for any growth we see. Next slide, please. The benefits of the project for us here, um, we're closing the, the covered gaps to help people stay connected. If I drive across Highway 60 today, um, it used to be great for me when I when it's my old job, because if I needed a couple of, uh, or half an hour or so of quiet, I could actually take parts of Highway 60 and know that I wasn't gonna talk to anybody. But in today's world, that's really not an option that we can go through. I find uh, we need to be connected or available to be connected. So we are looking to close those communication gaps throughout Eastern Ontario. Through this project, we will increase capacity in the networks. 
Um, we are introducing competition. We are uh, expanding the, the fiber networks, the cellular networks uh, through this project. We will improve public safety. Um, so the ability to make the 911 calls throughout uh, many of our rural territories has been a challenge. When we do these public sessions, we often hear of stories where someone needed to make a 911 call, but the, the network was, there either was no network or it was unavailable. By introducing these new towers and the new network, we will help support expanded 911 coverage across Eastern Ontario. Municipal, uh, we're looking to improve municipal services. So whether it's the paramedics through some of the high definitions services we're supporting where paramedics will be able to talk real time with video to the hospitals, the emergency rooms when they're coming in with a patient in the, uh, in the ambulance, they'll be able to start to triage those quicker with video with those expertise in the hospitals. Public works, looking to find efficiencies in um, in the public workspace on, um, you know, if you look at the Internet of Things, the IoT space, some of the applications that are in there that'll tell you uh, how much sand a, a sander might be using or the grade of a grader, uh, et cetera, those types of opportunities. So looking for improved applications across the networks that have been built through the Eastern Ontario Regional Network over the past number of years. We're looking to improve economic opportunities in tourism. And when I used to, uh, my old days, when I used to come up to Halliburton County, the big goal was always, we just want people to come in on Thursday night. So they're here on Friday. They're able to make an extra long weekend, work from the cottage or, or from the uh, resort on Friday, spend some time with the family. And then, you know, they go back on Monday. Now we're seeing with this is we're seeing people come in on Thursday and they're maybe staying till Tuesday now because they're able to do so much of their work remotely through video calls like we are right now, through uh, improved services, and we're looking to expand on those opportunities for much of Eastern Ontario, especially where we really focus on a, uh, a strong piece of tourism as part of our economic growth. New towers will allow for future deployment of fixed wireless and new technology rollouts. So the network we're building today is not just for the next two or three years. We're building a, a network that's going to be sustainable for this foreseeable future. And even as technology changes, as we move maybe from a 5G into a new type of, of uh, wireless type services or expanded type services, the towers and the infrastructure that's being built will be reutilized for those types of things. So, you know, once that tower is built, it's not going to be rebuilt in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. So the goal for our project, um, East Ontario Regional Network had some very, uh, I'll, I'd say they're lofty goals, um, you know, very aggressive targets that we we're looking to achieve. As you know, living in many of our rural areas, uh, the topography of Eastern Ontario is very, very challenging when it comes to wire line or wireless solutions. Um, you know, whether it's the white pines, the granite rock, uh, you know, the, the leeward side towards the lakes, uh, the valleys and, and the, um, you know, the gorges we have, uh, it does make it very challenging for coverage. But with the plan we've laid out, we have very aggressive targets that we are very comfortable we will be able to achieve throughout the life of this project. So our overall goals in Eastern Ontario are to achieve 99% of coverage in Eastern Ontario where people live, work and travel on major roadways so that they can make and receive phone calls. We have a 95% target for standard definition on those same areas where people um, where people live, work, and travel, but that can support email, web browsing, and social media services. So, you know, if you need to do remote banking, uh, email, that type of stuff, that's what we're looking for. And 85% coverage across Eastern Ontario, um, which will support high definition services such as video conferencing, movie streaming, and other data intensive applications. And that's um, a very aggressive target, but based on our propagation and the plan that we have in place with our proponent Rogers, we feel that we are um, well on way to be successful in delivering those. Next, please. Now, I just, I'm not sure which slide this one is because there's a, we have about three different variations of this part of the presentation. So maybe we can just skip to the next slide. Maybe I'll just, uh, I don't know if the car drives on this one or not. So. We often get asked uh, when we're out into the communities why we're adding these additional towers. You know, we see towers in rural Ontario today. Um, why are we not just reusing those? Well, a couple reasons for that. First, we are using as many of those towers as possible where it makes sense. But when the network is developed, in this case, uh, through our RFP, we would have laid out a plan that we wanted to see the coverage, the 99, the 95, the 85%. 
Um, both the proponents in this case would have been Bell and Rogers came back to our RFP, which was an open RFP, uh, with a plan that to meet those targets, additional capacity would be required in the network. And if we look at what we have here, so we have the three tower sites, the two would be existing. Those traditionally may have been built for voice services, which the footprint of a voice service is quite a bit larger than it is for a high definition type service. And that's really driven by the amount of data or packet sizes that are required to be able to make a voice call versus streaming a video or um, you know, even doing some basic data transfer of banking. So for us to be able to meet our objectives, additional towers are required throughout Eastern Ontario to be able to provide those services. So we're looking to create as much of a seamless um, network as possible, where if you're driving across Highway 60, those handoffs between the towers is seamless to those who are on the phone. And by doing so, or by um, to be able to meet those targets, additional towers are required. Maybe hit the next slide. I think that's the big, this is the right presentation, the animated one. Maybe not, I can't remember. Oh, no, it's not. Okay, so, sorry. The, the big high tech for us is that car drives across there. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the towers themselves, generally the towers uh, will be between 60 and 90 meters high. And that is required for from a macro site in order to be able to optimize the coverage across uh, our rural territories. We have explored camouflage towers to see if there's ways that we could try to um, you know, minimize the impacts on the rural environments as far as uh, visible obstructions. A um, couple of concerns though that we came away with is first of all, in places where we've seen this done, and there's a couple of them on Highway 60 in Algonquin Park that I'm aware of, uh, you know, they were really nicely greened, plastic shredded with uh, with plastic all over them to be able to look like pine needles. If you drive through those, that was probably about 10 years ago, I guess, maybe a little bit longer because I lose track of time. Um, but if you drive through the park now, you'll notice that there's hardly any of those plastic needles left on those trees or those camouflage towers, and most of them now are on the ground. So really, we do have some concerns around uh, shedding of the plastic needles, which can drive into our lakes and our... our um, our countryside, so one of our concerns. The other concern to to camouflage a 90 meter tower almost doubles the cost of the overall uh, delivery of that site. When the towers are in, they will immediately support the 4G and the 5G um, technologies. So by having both of those will allow for incremental capacity on the sites and future-proof today's network for tomorrow. So. You know, we're looking um, really based on the spectrum that's available, we will have that ability to go 4 and 5G on these tower sites, as well as those, and that includes those upgrades that we're doing. That's what we're upgrading them to, is to the 4 and the 5G. Sorry, next slide, please. So for Halliburton Algonquin Highlands specifically, um, and I will just, a little caveat there, these notes were as of March the 15th, so just over a month old. Uh, we receive our data every month as far as where, this, where we are, so a little bit of a delay on here, but doesn't have a huge impact on the overall numbers. So from a county perspective, Halliburton County, we have 21 sites that are proposed to go into Halliburton County. Uh, for upgrades. So this is an existing tower. We're changing the radios. Well, we're not, but Rogers is changing the radios on those towers to be able to upgrade those services. 19 of those 21 sites have been completed across Halliburton County. Within Algonquin Highlands specifically, there were three sites that were to be upgraded and two of those have been completed. So we are making very good progress on our overall upgrades uh, across Halliburton County and within the Highlands. On the builds themselves, uh, that we've had some challenges here. We have 31 sites across Halliburton County that we are looking to, to implement. We don't have any completed yet. We do have some in flight. And in Algonquin Highlands themselves, we have five that are proposed. And again, nothing completed as of yet, but uh, plans to get some finished soon. Co-locations, there are four locations in Halliburton County that are proposed with one has been completed. And within Algonquin Highlands itself, there are two towers that we are co-locating the new equipment on. Uh, to date though, none have been completed yet. The uh, other one for us, the land use authority overall, um, at, for every new site that we're building, we need the LUA to be approved by the local municipality. So we have 31 of those that we've requested or we will be working on. Eight of those have been completed across Halliburton County. 
And when within the Highlands, we have five that are proposed and um, three of those have been completed. So we're making good progress on the LUAs. Uh, so we appreciate the work and the effort from the staff in Algonquin Highlands, working with Rogers and with Eastern Ontario Regional Network to move these files forward. Next slide, please. So steps to construction, this is um, more for awareness because often when we're out there, there's some discussion of, oh, well, you know, we, we've, we know there's something coming and we've heard of it, or there's some discussion in the community. Um, you know, where are we in the process? So just for an educational opportunity here, we thought we would share this as a timeline um, for the local communities. So the first step of any of this, which is probably the most challenging step and uh, one of the most difficult steps. And, you know, if I look at the Rogers acquisition team, um, appreciate some of the challenges that they have trying to find these, but the first step is to find a location that meets the needs of our network. Um, when the network is laid out, there's a propagation map that would show us the optimal locations to place towers within a certain range of space uh, to be able to have the network interconnect effectively. And that's essentially what we're building here is an interconnected network that will allow for the growth of, um, of this uh, network throughout Eastern Ontario. So the first step is to find that property that means the propagation maps, the coverage requirements, and then finding a willing landlord who would be willing to have a tower hosted on their property. Once that's been successful, the Rogers team would negotiate a lease with that landowner um, under certain terms of agreements and spe uh, specific applications. The next step on this, which is, um, this is part of, and I'll get again, I'll get into this in a slide or two, but it's uh, around part of the duty to consult. So the Crown, the province of Ontario has delegated this this um, portion of the process through the East Ontario Regional Network to help support them in. But once we've negotiated a lease, we know where we're going, we're required to conduct an archeological assessment, a stage one and a stage two, as well as a natural heritage assessment of the proposed site. So we actually hire archeological or archeologists to go out on site and they will actually do a walk of the site and see if there are any findings uh, in there. To date across Eastern Ontario on the 70 some sites, I believe we've completed maybe 80. Uh, we've had two locations where we've actually found um, colonial or pre-colonial uh, items on the site. And that is, um, that is um, so because we found those, we've had to relocate or, or change a little bit the uh, layout of the, the tower site. So um, it's an interesting process and one that was not anticipated when we started this project for sure. So once the uh, archaeological assessment, the NHA has been completed, we follow the land use authority process within the municipalities. So those applications would be put forward. Once that has been approved, we notify the province that the site is ready to proceed and then site preparation, ordering and delivering supplies and construction to begin. If we look at this process from what we're seeing, this is taking, you know, can take anywhere between 18 to 24 months to be able to go through this whole process from that end to end. The other piece that's important on this is throughout this entire process, we do have consultation with the Indigenous communities and organizations uh, to ensure that they're kept a prize of what's happening and the status of these sites. So that's an ongoing conversation that we have with our, our Indigenous partners. Okay, next slide, please. So on the First Nation consultations, so the East Ontario Regional Network is consulting with the Indigenous communities and organizations across the region. We are understanding and respecting their input is vitally important. We have spent um, uh, uh, I'll say almost a year uh, of the first year of the project working with the 18 Indigenous communities across Eastern Ontario to understand um, risks, mitigations, concerns, to learn uh, the value of some of the sites and locations. Uh, and it's very geographically, it's very different whether we're in Algonquin Highlands or we're down in uh, other parts of Eastern Ontario that may not, uh, you know, the topography is different, the landscape is different. Uh, so it's been a very uh, interesting learning for the Eastern Ontario Regional Network Group. And we've been sharing that information with our partners as Rogers um, to uh, as we work through this program. The Eastern Ontario Regional Network and the OWC strongly believe that the benefits of the project must extend to all communities, municipal and Indigenous in Eastern Ontario. 
and the consultation will continue throughout the full course of the project. And we do have meetings either monthly or quarterly with um, with two of the uh, communities that, that uh, reside within our footprint. Next, please. So how the municipalities play a key role? So the municipalities are responsible for the land use authority for the proposed new tower builds. Um, this is critical for what we're doing here. So Rogers Communication has completed the LUA process on behalf of the planned tower sites and will continue to work with the municipalities to obtain LUAs for the remaining sites. So we're looking at two remaining sites in Algonquin Highlands that we require the land use authority for. Post the LUA approval, the municipalities are key to moving the project forward by working with Rogers on processing building applications, et cetera, in a timely fashion. And again, we've been very fortunate in that space in Algonquin Highlands to have a good working relationship and good lines of communication with staff to be able to continue to move these programs forward. EORN's created a resource document for use by some municipalities and are always available to assist where possible. So we do have a tower siting resource guide, as well as a 5G resource guide, which is available on our website at the eorn.ca slash tower siting. And there's some really good information um, that we have been able to compile in there um, that is available for review and discussion. Next, please. So... At the end of this, so um, we are, um, we fall under the I said directions as far as tower site approval. So I said, which is the uh, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Group of Canada. So I said, has the authority under the Radio Communication Act to approve each site on which radio apparatus, including towers, may be located and to approve the erection of all mass towers and other antenna supporting structures. Generally, I said favors having the telecom, well, it's not generally, they really do favor having the TSPs, the telecom sewer, uh, service providers, the local public and the land use authority work together towards a solution which takes each interest into consideration. So they really do want the, the, um, the TSPs as well as the communities to try to find a, a solution that'll work for everyone. Under the the uh, I said procedures, if that is not possible though, if we've, we come to an impasse, um, either group can can uh, formally request a bar departmental intervention concerning a reasonable and relevant concern. So on the next slide, what is considered relevant? Um, and it's, uh, so I guess if we're looking at this here, so the concerns that are considered relevant by ISED are why the use of an existing tower is not possible. So again, one of the first things we look at is to say, can we use an existing tower that would would do the coverage that we require, create the network we want to build, meet the propagation goals that we have. Why is an alternate site not possible? Well, when we look at these sites, there is a, a ring that is, is considered and Rogers would go out and look at those and try to find the best possible site. And if the first one's not available, then they look to the next site. So they're working through that process. What is the TSP doing to ensure that the tower is not accessible to the general public? Well, that's a, a major health and safety concern. So that is a key to any of the TSP's positions when they're building these sites. How is the TSP trying to integrate the tower into the local surroundings? What options are available to satisfy aer aeronautical obstructions, uh, marking requirements at the site? So the, the tower lighting um, that would be required on there for safety. What are the steps the TSP took to ensure compliance with the general requirements of this document, including the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, Safety Code 6, et cetera? So that is all looked at and relevant to those discussions. Concerns which I said would deem to be not relevant would include disputes with members of the public relating to the TSP's service, but unrelated to the tower installation, potential effects that the proposed tower system will have on property values or municipal taxes, and questions whether the Radio Communication Act, the CPC 2-0-03, Radio Communication and Broadcasting Antenna System, Safety Code 6, locally established bylaws, and other legislation, procedures, and processes are valid or should be reformed in some manner. So that is, that is and that information, the information on this slide is taken directly from ICED's tower siting policy documents. Next slide, please. So the financial breakdown of the project, um, this, is an, uh, this is over a $300 million investment in Eastern Ontario that's being made between the federal provincial governments as well as uh, 
EOWC, EOMC, and Rogers. So a, a, a large, large investment in Eastern Ontario to, to extend the cellular network. $71 million of that is coming from the province of Ontario. Approximately $71 million of that is coming from the federal government. Uh, a contribution of $10 million was made by the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, as well as the Eastern Ontario Mayor's Caucus. And Rogers is investing a minimum of $150 million in Eastern Ontario to see this project um, succeed. In Halliburton County itself, a uh, contribution was made of $441,000, $442,000 to the project. And we really appreciate that, um, that contribution as it's, it's, it's been key in driving this program forward. We are working on our, uh, an ROI um, document at this point just to try to support the investment that's been made. But our initial ROI discussions on the amount of investment, uh, we are seeing some very positive returns across Eastern Ontario and we'll bring in those up in the future. Next slide, please. Oh, maybe I'm done. Oh, there we go. So timelines and next steps. So upgrades. Sorry, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I'm gonna have to turn my camera off. I'm a little, you know, I'm talking about broadband here, and I have to turn my camera off because I don't have very good broadband right now. So my apologies. I'll turn this off, and I'll be right back. Uh, so time timelines and next steps. So upgrades to the existing towers. Um, that is in well in progress. We are looking to have that completed by the end of 2023, and we are on track to do so. <laughs> Um, the land use authority process will continue through to 2024 and will be critical for us to be able to finish this in order uh, for us to be able to deliver the program by the end of 2025. The indigenous consultation process will continue through the life of the project, so until the end of 2025. New, con new tower construction, we are, well, we are with their contract. We are targeting to have this finished by the end of 2025. And announcements are ongoing throughout the life of the project, but we are looking to coordinate with the provincial and the federal government to be able to have formal announcements in each of the municipalities where the towers are going up to be able to celebrate the success of this program. And the last, I think the last slide. Oh, there we go, questions. So any questions? I'll try to turn my camera back on here. I'll see if I don't wipe myself out, my apologies. It's interesting that uh, that an uh, ERN's representative would have difficulties with uh, with broadband. Oh, that's not lost on me. I, I, it's like one of my fears <laughs> when I connect in the morning. Like, please just work. And I, there's not even anybody in my house today. That's the worst part. So if it were my if my daughters were home and they were on it, then I would you know would have been a little more concerned. But I thought I'd be safe today. So my apologies. Um, just uh, for council's information, because we've got ERN's presentation which is basically about the project overall and the network as a whole, um, and, and followed by Rogers that will deal specifically with the Oxtong Lake application, that, that uh, Jason is going to stay on the line um, and, and all questions associated specifically with Oxtong Lake will ask after Rogers' presentation. And, and you know, if there's questions that, that Jason feels like he needs to uh, give us his, his input on, he'll be here to be able to do that. So we'll just try and follow that uh, that process. Um, so a, a couple of comments for myself first. Um, I'm hearing very much so that you absolutely prioritize co-locations before you look at new towers, wherever possible. Wherever right? possible, absolutely, yes. I mean, it, from a cost perspective of the project, it's much more efficient to be able to co-locate on an existing tower if it's able to support the equipment. And from a reference perspective, we often use like the, the new antennas that are going on to support the 5G project are they're pretty heavy, uh, but they're about the size of a of the door of, of a door going out. And there's six of those typically that go on a tower. So if the tower is able to support the weight and then with the wind, the wind shearing, the ice build, those types of things, our preference is always to co-locate where possible. It's much more cost effective. However, due to the age of some of the structures or the height of the existing towers, there are sometimes limitations to the ability to be able to co-locate. But if we can, that is our preference, absolutely. And, and when Rogers is looking at that, that would be their preference as well. Um, as long as it meets the coverage requirements, footprint requirements we have as well. So yes. 
Um, could you speak just in uh, briefly to the the implications if if one of the towers in your network is denied for some reason? Well, the, the concern we have is if when we've looked at the way the network's been laid out, it's the towers are all integrated together. So if it's an area is denied and we're unable to find a suitable location to move it to, there's two concerns. First is it creates a hole in the network because it'll actually be a spot where we, we've built the network to be able to have that interconnectability. Uh, that's not there. So it creates a dark spot or a black spot within the network where we won't have, we potentially will not have coverage. Um, excuse me. So that, that's the biggest concern that we'd have is it'll actually be unserviced areas across uh, within the network and it'll create essentially almost like a donut where we'll have the hole in the network. Um, Sorry, the, wanted... the other piece maybe just for this is, is the network that we're creating also. Yes, it does serve Eastern Ontario, but it is also part of a, a transport or interconnection network for areas just on the outsides of Eastern Ontario as well. So if we look as Highway 60 as an example, those tower sites are also closing some of the gaps, which would allow for continuous service into the Muskokas along Highway 60 and, and into those areas and also provide current and some future coverage as well within that network. Could you also address the, uh, I know that the federal government has some restrictions in place with respect to the types of land that can be used. Could you briefly just speak to that? Yes, under our project, um, so. We, we did look at municipal lands where that was available. Unfortunately, um, you know, in a number of cases, either it was not suitable, uh, it would not be stable, did not meet the, the design parameters of what was required from the network. Um, we were requested to stay off of Crown land um, because it triggers an environmental assessment, which can take quite a bit of time as well as other challenges in that space. Um, we've remained away from the Crown lands. And we've, um, <clears throat> so that's put us primarily into the, you know, the privately owned lands that are available within the footprint areas we're looking at. Um, my only other comment would be with respect to the uh, the consultation process and, and whether, you know, it should be timed a little bit differently. In some cases, it's been viewed as an information giving process rather as uh, some people look at a consultation as, a two-sided exchange of information and and uh, um, priorities for for both sides, and I'm wondering if if uh, you know going forward, you know, for future projects, um, or even in this project, that there is a way, and I, I I don't think it's possible in this project to start that process a little earlier when you're in the land selection process. I know that there's been some comments made by my members of council. You know, why why can't there be some some earlier consultation with the community uh, whereby you show the region within which or the, the sort of circle within which you need to have the towers located and, and public input might provide more suggestions about suitable and, and more, uh, you know, uh, acceptable sites. No, and I think that's a fair point. And we can definitely take that away for any future sites that we have in there. There are some concerns though, um, when we start looking at lands, because it is, you know, it's limited to a space of where we want to look at, we're cautious about sharing that information too widely because it's a very competitive landscape. So, you know, it's difficult to find a willing land owner who's willing to share space to build a tower and the environment's very competitive. So there's some concerns around either sites being scooped or we have had locations where a neighbor has found out that a lot is being considered and there's been you know, some threats or concerns raised by those neighbors. So the process itself, um, although I think it's a good point, we could be more transparent on a portion of it is a very competitive and can sometimes uh, some create some animosity throughout the community. So we are cognizant of that as well when the process is ongoing. But it is something I can take away and talk to Lisa and the communications team just to see if there is a, and, and the Rogers group as well, and Eric will be joining us later, but um, to talk about that to see if there's opportunities there. Thank you. Questions from council? Um, Councillor Barry and then Councillor Shortreed. Um, of the five builds that are 
projected for Algonquin Highlands. It says here that three of those have already been authorized. Can you speak to where those are and, and potential um, areas where the other two may be? I unfortunately right now I can't, um, but I can take that away and I can share that information. I, I just, I, I, my apology, I just don't have it in front of me right now, but I will take that away and, and share that information back through. Councillor Short Reed. I, I just want to comment that I, I think public safety is a priority and also that paramedics being able to virtually triage on site is life saving. And we also have to remember that we wouldn't be having this conversation 20 years ago. So 20 years from now, this is probably going to be needed plus more. So we're we're going forward, but we're going to need to go forward no matter what. Um, other questions for Jason? Councilor Barry. Um, I'm not sure if this is for you or for Rogers, but of this proposal, um, do you have any idea of how many people this will serve? How far of a distance in coverage? That's a question. Be? That's a question to follow Rogers' presentation. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can just wait till Rogers does theirs, and if we don't have uh, the answer you're looking for, we'll see what we can find for you. Okay. Uh, well, th thank you so much, Jason. And uh, do you have another question? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, in regards to the, there's quite a few links in in your presentation, and then they kind of take you down into another link and another link and another link, and. Um, one of the links that you offered is a 5G resource guide. Yes. And within that, and within that, there's information from the WH, WHO on page nine. Um, and, and that information is not available. When you go to it, it says an error code is found. So just just I wanted that okay. to be known. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We must have missed that or things have changed so, there. So I'll, I'll take that away. That's in the 5G resource guide. And then within that resource guide, that's the page nine WHO resource. And then I wanted to know in regards to some of the safety in the, um, in the, in the government of Canada link that you provided as far as understanding safety code six, um, that safety code six information came out in 2009 and was updated again in 2015. And I just wonder if you know if there's a new update because really 5G did not rolled out after 2015. So I just wondered if there's a new looking, if, if, if the safety code six has been looking at 5G specifically. I'm not aware of any updates to it since 2015, but again, I'll take yeah. that away and see what I can find. Um, no, that, that's a good question as well. So let me take that away. 2015, I'll see if I can find something. Or if there's been any changes, sorry. And, and the reason I ask that is because what I want to know is, is the information in regards to health and safety based on one tower versus being in a community where there's multiple towers and how, how a cumulative impact from multiple towers impacts human health? Okay. Okay, I just took a note of that. Other questions? Thank you, Jason. Thank um, you. We uh, Could I have a, a motion at this point to receive Jason's presentation? Councillor Short Reed and Richards. by Councillor Shortry, second by Councillor Richards. Be it resolved that Council receives for information a delegation from Jason St. Pierre, Eastern Ontario Regional Network, EWERN, regarding the Cell Gap Project. All in favor. That's carried. Okay, we'll bring in Mr. Bell Chamber. I know we were going in just a, um, a, a bit over time with our delegations, but I think this is um, valuable information and important information for us in our decision-making process. Good morning, Mr. Bell Chamber. How are you? Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Council and staff. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, have me as a delegation this morning. Well, if you'd like to go ahead with your presentation, 
Uh, certainly. Uh, I spoke to someone uh, on staff this morning about being able to simply show the uh, updated consultation summary and concurrence request and a table that I inserted in that and submitted to, to staff uh, based on addressing some of the questions and comments that came up during uh, the, uh, the last council meeting um, in an effort to address some of the items in the township's policy or protocol and where we've been able to uh, meet them and in cases where we haven't, how come? So one of the largest things that uh, came up during the council discussion last time had to do with the tower being within a thousand years of residences. And we're constrained with the East Ontario Regional Network cell gap project by uh, search areas and very targeted specific areas to uh, allow the 600 puzzle piece project to, to move forward successfully and achieve the stated goals that Jason mentioned of, of covering 99% of the residents of Eastern Ontario. So when it comes to these search areas, uh, we do our best to maximize the setback from residences, uh, but having a thousand meter requirement uh, simply isn't viable in today's day and age with the technology required. So essentially the, the setback of the proposed location for C8494 near Oxton Lake is consistent with other towers in the township and across the province uh, in general. Um, when it comes to being able to co-locate, uh, as Jason said, where possible, we definitely do want to co-locate as it uh, provides significant cost savings for the project. Uh, in this case, again, for C8494, co-location wasn't possible given not only the search area, which was roughly three kilometers from the existing Bell Monopole in the area, uh, but additionally, the Bell Monopole, unfortunately, isn't tall enough to accommodate equipment at a height that would satisfy the coverage objectives. Uh, the next box down deals specifically with the uh, potential uh, colo, uh, covering or, or masking of towers. And as Jason said, unfortunately, the experience has been that there's a great deal of shedding um, and negative impacts on the natural environment. Uh, additionally, the uh, camouflaged or masked towers are referred to frequently as monoplines uh, simply aren't able to be built tall enough to accommodate uh, equipment at 60 meters, which is the height for this proposed tower. And as a result, again, the covered objective simply wouldn't be met. The next box down uh, deals uh, with the natural landscape. In this case, we've done our best to use uh, existing access on the property and nestled the required compound for the tower just inside the tree line so that we're not uh, having to carve out uh, an access road that goes far into the forest uh, and, and have impacts on the natural environment that way. And the very last item, which can frequently be of concern for folks in these, uh, in these areas, has got to do with lighting. And we've received confirmation from Transport Canada that uh, no lighting will be required on this proposed installation. If we just slide down the text uh, just a little bit to refer to the municipality's uh, stated goals and the council's strategic vision, it's important to note that uh, in the staff report, the, the three ways in which this project accomplishes and meets some of the uh, strategic vision of the municipality, firstly, by maintaining infrastructure sustainability that meets the growing needs, as the council just referred to. Uh, it provides purposeful community engagement where we were able to uh, receive comments from the public and submit them for consideration by council. And lastly, it creates an environment that fosters year-round economic, cultural, and recreational vitality uh, by ensuring that people can use devices uh, for public safety, uh, for recreation. Um, but this technology definitely goes beyond simply uh, surfing Facebook or posting on Twitter. It really comes down to a, a very vital public safety uh, measure. And with that, I'm uh, available to answer questions. And uh, I, I did take note of a few of Councillor Barry's questions. I'm wondering if it would be helpful for me to address any of those at this point. If you can do that, I'm sure that uh, Councillor Barry would have much appreciated. Sure. So the first one that I made a note of had to do with uh, the approximate coverage distance or radius that uh, these installations typically provide. Uh, it is based on a whole host of factors, uh, including the height of the tower, uh, the topography of the area, the number of users in the area, and the amount of data that those users are essentially using or consuming. So in a very rural environment with a 90 meter tall guide tower, the coverage range may be uh, upwards of 10 kilometers. 
Uh, however, in a more hilly environment with a 60 meter self support tower with dozens and dozens of people uh, on Oxton Lake, for example, that coverage area shrinks down to anywhere between six and eight kilometers. But again, it's heavily dependent upon uh, the number of people in the area. So there'll be some seasonal variations. Uh, it depends on uh, the season as well when it comes to leaves on trees and the ability for the radio frequency signals to propagate through the area. Um, but the careful placement of these, uh, as I said before, really is part of a, a huge puzzle and making sure that these puzzle pieces all fit together to ensure that consistent, constant coverage and uninterrupted service. So there isn't that type of donut hole that Jason referred to. Um, does that address your question, Councillor Barry? Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. When it comes to some of the other sites, uh, specifically uh, in Algonquin Highlands, I was responsible for uh, the acquisition of one site uh, near Maple Lake. It was C8525. Uh, and it was somewhat similar uh, to the proposal at Oxton Lake. Uh, it was slightly further set back from Maple Lake uh, by about 100 or 200 meters. Uh, in this case, it was a 90 meter tall guide communication tower. Uh, and there was no opposition whatsoever to it. Um, so that's that's one of the ones that, that I was aware of, but I don't think I've done any other sites uh, or been responsible for sites in Algonquin Highlands. Uh, the last question had to do with 5G and safety code six updates. Uh, so it's important to remember that 5G is, um, while it is the next generation of communication technology that allows low latency, uh, so very, very responsive, very fast communication with the network, it is still using the same radio frequency signals uh, that 4G have used in the past. Uh, there are some slight changes to the nature of the technology, but adhering to safety code six, which already has a 50 times margin of safety built into it, um, our sites are always compliant with safety code six. Uh, for what it's worth at the base of most of our towers, uh, when studies have been completed, the amount of RF exposure is a fraction of the allowable limit of safety code six. So it's not as though there's someone trying to dial it up and, and get very close to that limit. The antennas themselves being either 60 in this case or 90 meters up in the air uh, provide an enormous margin of safety. As I said, it's typically hundreds if not thousands of times below the allowable safety code six threshold. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry. The, the other part of the question was in regards to the impact. How, how what, I, what I couldn't get clarity on is how the cumulative effects happen when there's multiple towers in an area. Like if Oxtong all of a sudden had 10 towers, how would that affect it health-wise regarded differently from a community that might only have one tower? Sure. And the, the very short and straightforward answer is there is no negative effect uh, for health, whether there is one tower or, or 10 towers, as you said. Uh, if you look at an urban environment, uh, I was recently in Toronto, there are rooftop installations on almost what seem to be every building uh, to satisfy the requirement for service and coverage in that area. Uh, so if you were to think about a rural environment like Oxton Lake uh, with the existing Bell Tower and our proposed 60 meter Rogers Tower, there would still be simply a fraction of a fraction and it, it, it gets lower and lower as you get further and further away from the facility. So if there were 10 towers surrounding Oxton Lake, there would still be nowhere near the allowable safety code six uh, limits. Other questions? Councilor Short Reed. I, I just wanna make a, a comment. Just um, COVID, pushed our council chambers into this, I think, wonderful technology. But I think we have to remember that people need to have the option to learn, work, and live with this technology too. It's not going away. It's going to get bigger and bigger. But, you know, like people going to school, they, you know, for lots of kids who couldn't get residence, I mean, this is an option. They can do school from home. They don't, if they want to go to university or college, they can do it from home. I know numerous kids that couldn't get residents, that couldn't go to school because of that. So because of the lack of housing for students. So we have to remember it's it affects everybody in every, a different way and everybody should be able to have the option to use this technology. Um, do we have further questions? Go ahead. Oh, sir, if I can just touch on that very briefly, I think it's a, an excellent point. When it comes to bridging the rural divide, 
and ensuring that whether you live in a city like Ottawa or Kingston or Cornwall or near Dwight, that you have the ability to stay connected uh, and, and not be uh, not be limited by something that you don't have control over. And this is the one go around where Rogers with the joint funding from the various levels of government is prepared where there is no business case to do so to spend considerable resources, uh, time and money to ensure that rural divide is, is bridged uh, and that connectivity is, is a, an option for your community. Councillor Richards. If we were to have the preference of looking for an alternative site, uh, how long would that process take and what could we do to assist with uh, finding that alternative site? Well, when it comes to alternative sites, I think that the first conclusion needs to be made as to whether or not there's anything objectively wrong with the site that's been put forward from a land use planning perspective. Uh, the staff report that was provided uh, clearly indicates support for the proposal, uh, that objectively speaking, there's no issue or nothing wrong with the proposed location. Uh, it's in our search area. It will meet the coverage objectives of the EORN cell gap project. Um, we have a, a signed lease agreement with the landlord, uh, and it, it will provide the, the services that it's intended to. Um, while some people may not want to see it or look at it, that extends beyond um, some of the jurisdictional role that the municipality plays. Uh, as Jason indicated, I said is the ultimate approver of any of these telecommunications facilities, but we do require municipal concurrence to do so. And municipal concurrence is concurring with the fact that the proponent, in this case Rogers, has followed the township's protocol uh, in citing the telecommunications facility. So if we had positioned it in a wetland or an area of natural scientific interest, or if there were migration issues or butternut trees, then by all means, those would be grounds on which to say, Rogers, you found an inappropriate location, find somewhere else. But when there is a lack of those uh, items and the site has been objectively suggested and offered or proposed in a viable location, then our preference is to see this through to its natural conclusion and based on the staff report, um, we're not sure why concurrence wouldn't be granted as we follow the process. So that's first thing. Secondly, when it comes to how long it would take to start the process over again, we'd be looking at months and months and months. Uh, we'd likely get very similar potential community opposition on very similar grounds. And so simply kicking the can down the road or, or moving it to a different area. Um, we have a targeted search area within which we have to find a location and and we've done so and and i think that's part of it sorry if i can jump in here as well i think that's part of it is you know rogers has done a really good job to proactively try to ensure that they meet all the criteria from the municipality but also for the siting the tower siting policies of i said in this case you know, if you know, we, we have till 2025 to have these projects completed, it's 2023 now for us to restart that process to go through this. I am very concerned that we would not be able to build the tower within the allotted times that we have in our contract with the provincial and federal governments as well. So to restart the process would be very, very challenging to us to be able to meet our target goals from the ORN perspective. Um, Councillor Barry, um, within within your report in the Rogers report, it says that the proposed tower is within a thousand meters of residence, and ours is in in our policy it says a kilometer, which is virtually the same thing. I just curious, can you confirm how 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 close it is within okay. the thousand meters to the nearest residence? Yes. It looks to me as though the nearest residence would be on the south side of Highway 60, uh, potentially Councillor Dayu's uh, property slash residence. It's within 150 meters of it, and to the south, it's within 160 meters of, of the next one. And again, in the table that I provided in the updated consultation summary and concurrence request, this distance, this setback is consistent with all of the other towers 
in the wider area and placing it a kilometer away from where people live, work, and play uh, simply isn't viable and, and will not achieve the coverage objectives and will additionally require more towers to satisfy and service the areas that would, have, would otherwise be left in a void. So we're trying strategically to place the towers to minimize the proliferation of them across the countryside. Uh, and by successfully placing them within the search areas that we have and, and meeting the coverage objectives, it will require that they are closer than a kilometer or a thousand meters from residents. Mm -hmm. Jason, Jason, did, did you have a yeah, comment? No, I, no, this and this has been a challenge. Um, when we look at some of the local tower siting policies has been a challenge for this project because part of the purpose of this project is to provide enhanced and better services for residential customers. A lot of the old tower siting policies or discussions were really around voice applications where they could travel large uh, geographical coverage areas and be in really remote areas. But for this project to be successful and for residents really to gain the benefit of the overall program, the towers are required to be closer to residential areas to provide the services. And that has been a, a bit of a challenge that we've come up across on some um, tower siting policies at the local municipal level. So, so although we appreciate why they were, were put in place um, a number of years ago, it's just with the, the requirements of residential needs and technologies, we find that there are some challenges in that space now. If I can just add on to that very briefly, as Jason said, when these protocols were enacted, whether it was 10 or so years ago, uh, the tower technology was such that there could be that type of setback and that the towers could be significantly further apart and still have the signal propagate um, when there were fewer users on the network and they weren't using uh, high definition data. Um, uh, okay, so additional questions. So we have a resolution on the floor uh, that's receiving Roger's delegation as well as, as deciding on the application based on Sean's recommendation, which we're, which we're all aware of. Um, I, I, I want to say that from my perspective, and I think from all of our perspective, this is a difficult decision because we have heard a certain amount of opposition. Um, and it's been uh, like I, I have to uh, I have to commend the people in Oxlung Lake for for the detail, uh, the amount of energy and the arguments that they've made. They've done a very good job and it is it's created a lot of uh, uh, sleepless hours in my world. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time speaking with Eorn, uh, meeting with the Oxlung Lake folks and Eorn, as well as a meeting with with Sean. Uh, quite a few hours have been spent looking at that. And and the thing that bothers me is that no matter what we decide, some people are going to be upset. Um, and and there's just no getting around that. And it doesn't matter which way we go, somebody's going to be upset. Uh, I just believe for the for the greater good um, that there are more people that that are going to be wanting this service than there are those that are that are concerned about it. And uh, that's just that's just my perspective. I, I know it's a tough one, but uh, um, just one more time. Are there any more questions for either Eric or Jason? So could I have a mover and a seconder to put the motion on the floor? Councillor short read, Councillor Richards. By Councillor short read, second by Councillor Richards. Be it resolved, Council receives a delegation from Eric Bellchamber, wireless site specialist regarding proposed Rogers Telecommunications Tower Site C8494, and that Council is satisfied the procedures in the Township's telecommunication facility installations policy has been followed in order to comply with the requirements for the consultation with public and land use authority for the tower proposal, and further that Council directs staff to advise Rogers Communications Inc. that Council supports the installation of a 60 meter telecommunications tower known as Rogers Site C8494 4539 Highway 60, part of lots 8 and 9, concession 13, Geographic Township of McClintock. All in favor? Um, I am in favor. So all opposed? 
That's a defeated motion. Thank you, gentlemen. Your time and presentations are much appreciated. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this particular application. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's time to have a break. So we will reconvene at quarter two. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Next on the agenda is building and bylaw enforcement and uh, and the and monthly report. Good morning, Mr. Moore. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Yeah, please see before you the uh, the uh, month in report for the building bylaw department regarding the month of March. Um, Hasn't changed too much since the uh, beginning of the year. It is starting to uh, show a few more permits. Um, basically the highlights are another 15,000 in permit fees and construction value of 1.9 million. Are there any questions on the, uh, on the report? Could I have a mover in a second or then to receive it? Councilor Short Reed and Richards. <laughs> By Councilor Sharvey, second by Councilor Richards, be it resolved, Council receives report BLDG 923 regarding monthly activities for information submitted by Greg Moore, dated April 20th, 2023. All in favor? That's carried. And next is, uh, next up is the revised clean and clear bylaw draft. Good morning, Mayor Jason, members of council. Uh, before you is the draft clean and clear bylaw uh, with the required changes as made. Um, I would like to point out that upon further review of section seven with the exemptions uh, in consultation with the planner, staff agreed there's a need to further define environmentally protected areas. Uh, and in saying that there could be existing uh, legal non-conforming development in an EP zone uh, but not in any of the EP1, EP2, or EP3 zones. So in saying that, uh, staff are recommending that section 7.1, subsection G11, uh, be changed to read environmentally protected areas zoned EP1, EP2, and EP3 would therefore be exempt. I uh, Personally, I still don't understand why any EP zone would be exempt. In, in in any way from the bylaw, I I just don't. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's okay. And to to help clarify that uh, through you, Mayor, um, when I was reviewing with planning, um, basically EP one, EP two, and EP three zones would never have development on them. Um, but again, there was a section reworded in the exemptions that would still classify any refuse to be captured. So we're not we're not. We're able to enforce if there's refuse, but we wouldn't be dealing with other things on EP1, EP2, and EP3, for example, long grass or branches or things of that nature. We're, we're still going to be able to capture refuse on any EP zone, but we just want to be able to say that those wouldn't apply to the rest of the bylaw. So if, if I could ask you to review um, just the, the little uh, addition there uh, in exemptions, section three would capture refuse. Uh, so we have a basically an exemption in the exemption um, to say that we will always be dealing with refuse no matter what zone. It just seemed counterintuitive to me too, but I, I get what you're saying and I can accept that, you know, the change. Question, Councillor Barry. 
in regards to that specific item, what about the, would the exemption be included for the eight inches in height in, in grass or that would be an exemption as well? Yeah. Okay. Um, questions, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Thank you. And on that same point then, let's say you do find that there is a site, um, EP one or two, and someone has developed it in a way that they shouldn't have. What, what would the process be? And I know that that isn't directly related to this bylaw. I'm just wondering, in the case where something has occurred, um, so it isn't in its fully naturalized state, and there maybe there is a yard and there is some composting, um, would you then be able to retroactively apply this bylaw to that? Or would there be a higher order of policy that would help you to um, rectify the area? Sure, through you, Mayor. Um, my understanding with planning would be that those, those zones, EP1, EP2, and EP3 are not to be developed in, the, in any form. Um, so I guess I would have to review back with management and then uh, involve planning because I would imagine the zoning bylaw would supersede uh, the clean and clear and we would enforce under uh, the Planning Act and under uh, zoning. Other questions or concerns? So are you are you are you satisfied with that answer? Or you want to? Uh... Yeah, I am because I I've, okay. I've been in the same mental loop as you. But hearing that if those things do occur because there is a, some form of development, we have a higher level of policy to rely on. That's what satisfies my my worry there. Okay, Councillor Barry. I know we talked about this at the last meeting, but in item eight point four under administration and enforcement, it says that an officer may at reasonable times, that's the that's the sentence that we talked about. And I know that in, in your definition, you said that that means like date working hours. I still don't, I still don't understand that. Like I know that to me, I still see it as reasonable times as, um, I don't see it as a time of day. I see it as what's reasonable to our municipality or each other, but I don't see it as a specific time. I do appreciate the other sentence that you put in there in regards to management with a meeting with the CAO, but the reasonable times I have a hard time understanding. But the way it reads to me, it doesn't it doesn't specify daytime, nighttime. So. Um, I guess I need to hear from other members of council about whether that's a concern or not. I mean, because I, 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 this is our fourth kick at this particular can. Not that it's a can. You've done a lot of hard work on it. Um, you know, I, I would like for us to be able to move it forward today if we can. So um, are there uh, other thoughts on that concern that's been raised? Deputy Mayor Dayu? I do fully hear and appreciate what Councillor Barry is saying. But for me, that clause suggests we are a reasonable institution. Anything we do will be done reasonably and respecting your rights. And it kind of covers... It covers a series of things to, to show that we're not the boogeyman. We're going to do this respectfully. And so for me, what's written is, is adequate for the need. But I do, I do hear what you're saying. Other questions or concerns? I, I have to say that um, I, I'm still... I've talked to our CAO about this, and I've talked to, uh, spoken to it at a previous meeting. I still am concerned about the uh, the warrant, a uh, search warrant aspect of it. You know, to me, this is a this is a new bylaw. We're a small community. Uh, we're expected to, as as Deputy Mayor Dayu says, approach things in a in a reasonable manner. I'm just not. I mean, to me, I'm just not sure that I'm ready for search warrants. And I understand that that is a very, very rare occurrence. And, and should it be needed? You know, you gave a, a, a good example. At last time, I just am not sure that the community is ready for search warrants in, in regard to this bylaw, at least not at this point. Um, so that's also something and I'd like to hear from other members of council. I, I don't want us to I'd like to resolve these questions today that anybody's got, whether we're all on site or not, and be able to move forward. So, uh, Councillor Barry. In regards to your comment, is there a chance that that could come in later? Like, if this is reviewed when we do our reviews? All bylaws can be reviewed and updated at any time. 
Councilor Richards. I'm wondering on the uh, search warrant, um, if that's something that could go to council in a closed session, um, make us feel more comfortable about it. Mm, I would venture to say that the clerk or the CAO would likely say no, unless we understood why. There's such strict requirements for closed session discussions um, that uh, I, I can't see what that might be at this point in time. I guess I would look to the clerk. Um, with regards to if, if Council Richard means that we need a search warrant, that would that could potentially be looked at as legal, but it depends on the circumstances surrounding it. When it comes to closed session, if, if say, for instance, clo uh, the need for the, the ability to get a search warrant was included in the bylaw, I would, I would think um, that that's a matter, I mean, we, we, it's, it's been amended to say that, you know, under, in discussion with, with management and the CAO, that if, if a situation escalated to such a point, it would come to council and be discussed in closed session, you know, when, it, when it's about a specific individual or property. But to be able to talk about it in general, about whether we would include that in our bylaw or not, it doesn't qualify for closed. Deputy Mayor, do you? My one concern about removing it now with the possibility of including it later on is that almost certainly the moment we want to have it included is the moment we need it. And by then it's already too late. We've already got an emergent situation and we don't have a bylaw to help us act accordingly. I personally do not have a difficulty with how this line is worded. It does say extraordinary, and I believe that to be true. I think, you know, we may never in this term ever use that. Um, I'm, I'm happy with it. Uh, Councilor short -Reed. I agree. Using the word extraordinary, I think, puts it down to it's got to be something extremely important and extremely necessary. Okay. It sounds like it stays as is. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Barry. Well, the last concern I have, and I do appreciate all the work that's gone into this, is just, I might be the only one, but um, when we're talking about some of the larger areas in this bylaw, I feel that item 4.1G in regards to the height of grass, to me, I just think, is this something that could come back later? I don't, I don't see this as a huge, environmental issue or I see it unsightly is is, is um, subjective. Um, if, did you want to revisit with us the rationale for, yeah, somebody's phone has been vibrating and I guess there's no way to stop that. But I find it disconcerting. Um, Speak to the height of grass and why you landed on that particular height. And Sorry. I know that we've talked about this before, but you know, I want us to be as comfortable as we can get. You're right, it's subjective, but it, I mean, it, it can be extremely unsightly, it, especially if it's a long-term situation. Certainly through you, Mayor. Um, Councilor Barry, the, the reason that there is an actual um, like height, uh, for example, would be, uh, basically for evidence supporting and, and for court purposes. Um, it takes out the discretionary component. Um, if, if an officer was to attend property, they would have uh, the tools at their disposal to measure uh, the height uh, and provide photographic evidence to support that in court. Um, it, it's just sort of another piece to, to ensure enforcement. Um, the way I came to that specific uh, number was uh, you will see certain bylaws of clean and clear uh, from six inches, 12 inches, 20 inches, like it does range, but that was the most common uh, measurement. So I just sort of took that and worded that in. Again, should council decide that perhaps that is not um, the number to use, uh, you know, we can, we can certainly change that. There, there's no uh, rule of thumb. It was just based off of uh, majority of bylaws were, were meeting that, that height restriction. Um, would you be, uh... Personally, I wouldn't like to see that section come out because that's part of part of the concern that's been raised, you know, from time to time. Would you be 
happier with a different height, like, you know, would 10 inches or 12 inches, uh, something like that be more acceptable to you? Yeah. And I mean, I feel like if, if, if we went up to 12, we could always come back down if all of a sudden no one in the municipality is cutting their lawns anymore. Thoughts from other members of council? Eight, 10, 12. Like I, you can say no other comment, but we need to land somewhere with this. So, you know, I, I'm looking to hear from, it's, it's, it's subjective, but we need to decide and, and, and today. Pick a number, arm I'm wrestle. I'm totally fine with it as it is. So, I mean, okay. if you want to go higher, fine, but. You know, you're fine with it as I'm it is, fine or with it is, yeah. I mean, I, I think everybody see once grass gets to like six inches, the weeds start taking over and goes crazy. So, I mean, height wise, it's going to be irrelevant because after that point, it's still going to look unsightly no matter what number we use. And you're talking about for an extended period of time. If somebody's away, I can I, I probably have to confess that my grass has reached eight inches from once or twice in its lifespan. Um, Deputy Mayor Dayu. I, I go back to um, our staff's comments in previous sessions on the discretionary part of this. I think that the, the term unsightly, as you said, is there to help you use teeth that you hope you never need to use, but if you have to, you have to. Uh, in areas where eight inches makes sense because it's a, it's a fairly wild area. There are trees all around. I don't think this bylaw would ever come into effect because there will probably not be a complaint there. It's only going to be in certain circumstances that are even hard right now to understand that where this is going to come into effect. So I'm, you know, I'd say 10 just for choosing a number, but I don't think that where we live for the majority of property owners, this is going to be a, problem. So, a, a real problem. I see this as becoming more of an issue in, in for instance, a developed subdivision where every yeah. house is the same. The lawns that's are all right. manicured and mowed, and there's one in the middle that's yeah. got just not looking so good that's... compared to the rest. So we're sticking with eight inches, I'm hearing. Any other comments or questions? Um, I know you've done a lot of work on this and, and you've, you know, I mean, you've had to make a number of revisions based on our discussions. This is a new thing for us. And, you know, it's, a, to me, this is a big thing, um, in a number of ways, you know, it's a new measure of enforcement. It's an ability to, for you to be able to deal with situations because there are some pretty nasty situations that need to be dealt with. So I, I would thank you for, uh, for your work on this and, and, uh, and for your oversight of the project, Greg, as well. So could I have a mover and a seconder then to, uh, we're not, this is actually, we're gonna pass the bylaw during the bylaw section, right? We're dead. So received. this is receive, mm -hmm. mover and a seconder. Councilor Richards, Deputy Mayor Dayu. by Council Richard, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dayu, be it resolved Council receives report BLDG 1023 regarding the revised draft clean and clear bylaws submitted by Kristen Glass and dated April 20th, 23, and further the Council directs the bylaw as amended be brought forward for adoption. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go forth and enforce. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Next is Parks, Recreation, and Trails. Morning, Mr. Card. Morning, Mayor and Council. So the first item is an update from the Recreation Committee. Who wants to speak to that? Yes, so uh, typically it is directed through uh, the, the council members that are present at the meeting. Councillor Richards. Uh, well, we had our second meeting last night. Um, 
to the minutes presented or from the first meeting. Um, you know, we're we're all getting to know each other and things are are moving along. Um, we have some events coming up that we're going to be working on. Uh, one of the things that we'd like to do is to put out a survey to the community, and we're hoping to have uh, council support in uh, developing that survey. Um, Councilor Shortreed. And just to add to that, um, we spoke about just putting thoughts in the air about um, reopening of the rec center. And if council wants the recreation committee to start thinking of ideas of a grand reopening when it happens. Um, I might be getting ahead of myself, but I think that that's maybe something that we need to discuss as a council uh, um, first. And I, I know that, you know, you're, the, the thoughts that I, I mean, I, I did attend the meeting last night and uh, and I was pleased to see, that, you know, the, the committee, it's, it's a new area for us because the committees are all brand new. You know, we've been without a committee structure for a long time. So it's taking a bit of time for, you know, we've got new members. There's lots of big ideas. Um, but I think that, um, you know, uh, the council may have some specific thoughts um, to uh, to discuss about something like that. Um, there would be a budget associated with it that may not be, you know, included in, in our existing budget. Um, I, I think we need to have that discussion here and, and then say, you know, go ahead and, you know, give us your ideas and thoughts about what you'd like to do. And, uh, you know, but at this point in time, we're not even sure of the are we having a Christmas event? Are we having a spring event? Are we, you know, maybe it's a fall event if we're really lucky. So I think we need to kind of get an idea about the timing as well, uh, which would form, I think, some of the aspects of that. Um, as to a survey, um, obviously, well, the, the committee was asked to kind of put their thinking caps on and about the questions that they might like to ask. And, and uh, Chris is helping in, in you know, sort of uh, talking about, okay, what do you think about events? What do you think about the, the programs that we've got now? What do you think about programs that you might like to see in the future? The committee did decide as, uh, you know, given uh, Chris's recommendation to stay away from what would you like to see in capital improvements, because that's just getting out way too far right now. But uh, I, I would hope generally that council would agree that the idea of a survey to see what people are looking for in recreational services is not a bad idea. Assuming that that survey comes back to us um, and we have input into it as well. Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you? Yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, my continued hope is that we do continue to disaggregate the information we collect from the survey respondents to know are they full-time residents? Are they are they seasonal? Um, do they have children? Uh, you know their age range, etc. So that we really know who we're talking to here, and that one subset doesn't overwhelm the needs and interests of the other um, unnecessarily. Good point. Absolutely good point. Uh, Councillor Barry. In, on item number seven, it says other business. I'm just curious in regards to regarding the length of time for meeting. Like most meetings that we attend are two hours. It's not written in stone, but I just wondered why the shortened. I would just think with a new committee, there would be. I think we found last night that 90 minutes doesn't cut it. Um, but but I would think, I mean, that that's a, uh, I, like I would think of that as a guideline. Um, some committees are very strict about, you know, okay, that's it, 90 minutes at council meetings or some often set that way that you have to pass a resolution to continue on, pass a set time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, what I see happening is that, the, you know, at the beginning, early stages of this committee, they've got a lot of thoughts and ideas and the discussion is going to be wholesome. Uh, whereas, you know, once things sort of start to, you know, you catch stride, that you know you might be able to meet the 90 minute period we we were two and a half hours last night mm -hmm. now short reading i think the 90 minutes is just a guideline and we've had lots of rec meetings that were even with committees that have been around for a long time well over 90 minutes but it's just a guideline and it, it also for you it, it also says that a discussion regarding a round table the amount of um in regards to bringing in something forward is that to be discussed at that meeting or to be brought forward for the next meeting, just in regards to sharing information. 
It, it's because I think during the first meeting, if what I understood happened is correct, there was a lot of discussion, kind of a, a lot of it outside of the terms of the agenda. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity for people to say, here's an idea I've got, and, and I'd like to put it on a future agenda for us to have a discussion about. And, and there was some agreement at the at the committee level about here's some standing items, you know, like like the survey mm -hmm. for one. Um what could happen at Dorset, you know, might remain a standing item for a while. Those sorts of things are raised and agreed upon to be standing items, or, you know, we're going to talk about that at our next meeting. Go ahead, Councillor Sherry. Every, almost everyone on the committee is new, so I think everybody's finding their own feet and getting to know everybody and how the process works. So, like, the mayor said, I think that's what we need to get them funneled into how each item works so that they can save their thoughts for that round table. Seem to work well. Any other questions? Uh, there was uh, quite a bit of discussion. Uh, I, I would say just for council's thinking processes, uh, quite a bit of discussion about future partnerships. Um, and, you know, with emphasis put on the opportunities that might be opened up by partnerships with lake associations, with the between committees, uh, you know, there's opportunities for, for say, the rec committee to work with the cultural committee or the rec committee to work with the airport committee, you know, in, in the future, because there's lots of opportunity for airport events as well as uh, as recreational events, and there's no reason why they can't combine. We need to get that airport committee in uh, in place first off. Any other questions about the uh, rec committee? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the minutes of March 23rd? Sorry, uh, Councillor Short Reed and Richards. By Councillor Short Reed, second by Councillor Richards, be it resolved that the March 23rd, 2023 Recreation Committee meeting minutes be received for information. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, next is your monthly activities report. Yes, so uh, this time of year is all about recruitment, uh, setting up training for new staff that will be onboarding the coming weeks to ramp up for summer operations. Uh, moving operations from uh, winter to summer. It never ceases to amaze me how quickly it happens. Just a few weeks ago, people were still skiing. Uh, the lakes are now open and the water trails and we have our canoe rental uh, uh, equipment in place to start going through rentals for that. And they're taking a lot of bookings. Um, I would like to just uh, highlight a couple of uh, programs that are coming up, as well as some needs around some uh, uh, volunteerism for soccer. So this weekend's the Community Cleanup Day for Canada Day in Dorset, and uh, folks can come out. It's 9 to 11 and uh, be assigned an area where uh, very much community driven and something that's been very long standing in the area. Uh, to just do some some garbage cleanup and ditches and those types of things now that the snow has melted back. So that's this Saturday. Um, the youth soccer program, we're looking for um, uh, volunteers uh, for soccer coaches still at the moment. We need 20 volunteers as a target total. Right now we're sitting at seven. So, uh, well, you know, on our way, but still uh, looking for volunteers uh, on the note of looking for people in recruitment, we still have four positions available for our Stewardship Youth Ranger program, and those are fantastic positions for youth that uh, are taking care of our water trails every day, uh, campsite maintenance, portage, and, and hiking trail maintenance. Um, one thing I'd like to let Council know about is we were doing a replacement on the Alvin Johnson Park zip line, which was planned. As we were going through that, we realized a need for the replacement of a portion of the seat that hangs down from the zip line. Um, those parts are on order. So the zip line's down until uh, we get those parts in. Hopefully in a week or two, uh, the park's not getting a ton of use just yet, but it will be ramping up. Um, but that's just to make everybody aware. And those are the highlights that I have. Um, a couple of comments. Um about two things. Uh, one thing that we kind of missed out on was that the committee had talked about, and this is going to volunteer recruitment and the need for volunteers. The committee has been talking about 
the need to, to do some major outreach for volunteers as a whole, not just for recreation, but, you know, there are other committees that will be looking for volunteer help. So, you know, how that, it, that might be a discussion that council wants to have as a whole about how we approach that and what we do. There was an idea raised uh, last night about, uh, it wasn't like, like we have done volunteer appreciation events, but, but um, I understand Highlands East is holding a fairly substantial event bringing in people, trying to recruit them, regain interest in volunteers without using the word volunteers, I might add. But, uh, you know, I think we probably need to, to put some effort and thought into how we go about recruiting volunteers and, uh, you know, going beyond recreation. I see that a lot of them are needed in recreation, but we'll need volunteers in, in other areas. So um, maybe we can have a discussion about that at an upcoming council meeting fairly soon because obviously we are in dire need of volunteers and how we approach that so thinking caps on and uh, um, the, the other thing that I wanted to raise with respect to cleanup um, you know it's it's I've, I've heard uh, from several sources that there are other cleanup um, programs that are taking place by lake associations you know in, in different areas of the municipality um, you know, I, I'm not sure if that happens in Oxtongue, but I know that there are several lakes in the Stanhope area that do clean up. One of them, the Hulse Hawk, does clean up at Elvin Johnson, goes along the roadsides. If they're seeking support um, in a similar way that Dorset gets, I'm assuming that, that that would be something that we would be more than willing to, to entertain because it's all in the betterment of our community. So, you know, something, something for us to consider. I guess what I would say at this point is if somebody is doing a cleanup, that they all they need to do is really approach us from the association and say, you know, you, we you want to work together. This is another form of partnership. So another item for discussion. Any other uh, comments or questions? Sorry, Adam CAO. I just have a quick question for clarification for staff. Um, around the recruitment, volunteer recruitment discussion, do we, is council looking for anything from staff for that discussion? I I don't know that there's anything that you can do in advance un, unless there's, you know, you've got knowledge, say, for instance, of other efforts that have been done in other municipalities um, to to look at a sort of a, a grand recruitment scheme. Um, otherwise, I think we just need to land on how we're going to approach it and, you know, who's who's on first with respect to that. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Barry. I can't remember if it was at Roma or some webinar or something that I watched, but I remember there was some sort of discussion about instead of having the title volunteer, having different sort of types of volunteers, like there's people with accessibility issues that maybe would make a wonderful facilitator or getting the word out opposed to standing at an event. And there's people that have, you know, different, they're, they're more physical and they can help do things. So maybe, maybe thinking of what kind of volunteers we need and 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 having a wider reach with with more titles maybe well and that's one of the things that the committee has discussed the fact that you know not not everybody has the same skill set mm -hmm. or once you you know you maybe you've got an event and someone's interested in in, in working on a, a music festival and somebody else you know is more than willing to give us you know power to move tables and chairs or clean up mm -hmm. or whatever somebody else uh, you know is has got an in for baking cupcakes for Canada Day. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that that's why I think we need to put uh, you know a fair bit of thought into how we approach it and 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 utilizing the skills that are in the community and letting people work on things that they're interested in working on. So well point well taken. Any other comments about that? So could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the monthly activity report? Councillors Richards and Short Reed. by Councilor Richards, second by Councilor Short, read via resolved council receipt report PRT 623 regarding monthly activities submitted by Chris Card dated April 20th, 2023. All in favor? That's carried. And the last item for you is the appointment of a bylaw enforcement officer. I know the uh, bylaw itself comes under the bylaw section, but did you wish to speak to that? Uh, just an overview that Michael Francis has just joined us as a 
uh, permanent uh, trail technician and bylaw officer. Uh, this would allow him to uh, enforce bylaws associated with the Halliburton Islands Water Trails Program. Any questions or comments about that? So no resolution at this time. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Much appreciated. Okay, next is uh, under environmental business, the uh, the latest version of the Environment and Stewardship Committee Terms of Reference. I think that might be over to Deputy Mayor Dayu. Um, I've just, um, Melissa is, is away today, so she can't speak to any part of this. Sure. Uh, so we, with with Don's help, we we've, we've tweaked the TOR, the terms of reference, to reflect our conversation from last uh, session. There wasn't a great deal to change, more of a reprioritization. And I was grateful to see that there was um, the the previous work plan that was included there. Really good reminder of where we were. And and I think uh, our only task would be to filter that list through the new terms of reference and see what falls out in what order. Uh, but but apart from that, no surprises. It's pretty much what was discussed at the last meeting. So I wouldn't see the uh, the list of activities is forming part of the terms of reference. That's not what you were saying. Okay. Uh, no, it is a great reminder that these were you know these are things that at first I missed that it. it was an a, an older list, and I thought how did that happen? Boy, Deputy Mayor, I use a committee all on her own. But you know, great starting point for the committee. So any other news about membership? Um, not at the minute. I, I did choose to wait until we had finalized this so that I could uh, circulate a, a final agreed upon terms of reference uh, to governor support. Um, the only comment that I had was, I'd have to, I don't know which section it was in, but with respect to submission of, um, of invoicing um, uh, that they would be submitted to finance and and the uh, I guess I wanted to get clarification on the timing um, given that it fits in with our budgeting cycle um, and we're okay with October 31st or not okay any other comments You've got a scrunch. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, you're the lady sitting in the knitted brow chair. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't see October. I saw January 2nd. Yeah, well, that that, that I thought was, uh, you know, if the committee needs to start thinking about it a lot sooner than that, you know, if, if we're going to get ready for projects on priorities, which comes a lot earlier mm -hmm. than that. So that's where, you know, kind of landed on October the 31st. And now I don't even know for sure what the terms of reference, what's the date on the terms of reference. January 2nd. So we need to uh, accept them as amended if that's acceptable. So if there's no further questions or concerns about them, I'll, uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to uh, receive them? Councillors Barry and Richards. By Councillor Barry, second by Councillor Richards. Be a result, Council approves the revise Environment and Stewardship Committee terms of reference as amended and direct staff to advertise for committee members. And then all previous terms of reference for the Environment and Stewardship Committee are hereby repealed. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you for your work on that. Um, next is Public Works. Welcome, Mr. Thorne. Good morning. So first up is the Dorset Rec Center and any updates? Yes, yeah, so the uh, proposal closes today and uh, the engineering firm will be looking over that next week with staff and then we will be coming back with more information. And hopefully a recommendation to move forward post haste. <laughs> of course. Questions? Okay, thanks. Um, next is your monthly activity report. Anything you'd like to highlight on the report? Nothing to highlight, just a typical time of year where we are doing the same as everyone else, transitioning over into, uh, into spring and summer. Um, the snow, we still had quite a bit of snow up in the Dorset and uh, Oxtongue area up till about last week. 
and within three to four days, it was pretty quick to disappear. So um, no, just um, standard switching over to different seasons. Um, I might ask a question about, uh, or maybe someone else would like to ask the question about your timing on sweeping. The sweeping, sand. yes. Yeah. So um, currently uh, crews are in the north end sweeping. Uh, one of our tractors was broke down, which we'll be getting back tomorrow. And then the sweeper will be put on it and it'll be put back into uh, service next week for sweeping. So we just have to watch because they are still calling for some uh, snow towards the end of next week, possible. I don't foresee us seeing snow, but uh, if we did get any kind of ice, then we've been caught before where we've swept and had to put sand back down. So we don't want to do that again. So, um, you know, it, it is, it is hard because you do get those days like last week where it's, you know, plus 28 degrees and everybody wants to be out on the road and no dust, but unfortunately we kind of have to wait. Plus our equipment is, is rather heavy. And right now we're in load restrictions on our roads. So our uh, water truck does put it over limit. So not over limit for the truck, but over limit for the road. And we have to be very careful with that as well. My little Subaru makes ruts and things, never mind <laughs> trucks. Yeah. Um, can you can you give us an idea about like what what's the length of time it takes to do sweeping from one end of the municipality to the other? Like, is that a month long or a couple of weeks or a couple of months? <clears throat> yeah. So it, it really depends. Uh, the past couple of years, we've really tried to utilize the weather. Uh, so if we get a nice light rain, it works great because both machines can run together or separately and we don't require the water truck. However, if we were to sweep in plus 25 degree weather, the water uh, evaporates really quickly off the road, which causes more staff time to be running back and forth. So, but on average, we're, we're around three to four weeks for sweeping. Generally, we're done sweeping by June on average. Thanks for that. Any other questions about the uh, monthly activities? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive that report? Deputy Mayor Dayu, Councillor Richards. Moved by Deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councilor Richards. Be it resolved, Council receives report PW823 for information submitted by Adam Thorne and dated April 20th, 2023. All in favor? That's carried. Next up is a uh, long overdue and exciting discussion. Yes, yeah, so uh, another big project that uh, that we're currently working on. Um, <clears throat> Tullock and staff have worked together on this for since 2000 and. 19 been back and forth with uh, with council as well and um, as the report will show we are pretty close to being ready to move forward um, we have increased the building size as the report uh, discusses that that due to some of the challenges we faced over the last little while that it, it does show that we should increase the building size to accommodate for future growth and the growth that we have done in the past couple of years um, also with this is that big picture discussion we had back at budget time and projects and priorities where we looked at a redesign of the current garage to allow for public works and maintenance to share a portion of the building. So um, although, yes, we are increasing the garage size, we are also losing um, the reason for that is because the space that we're losing elsewhere to gain for uh, for other um, departments, if you will. So the increased size is definitely a major change. And um, the location, we, we've had the discussion on the location, that's still optimal location. Um, fortunately, we were able to remove some of the sand from that location as well, which will help offset um, some of the groundworks that was required originally. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we would like to, with your support, move forward on this further. I, you know what, I, I should know the answer to this, but I recall with respect to the location that we, we agreed on the on that overall location, but did we agree on, you know, the which direction the building would go? I can't remember if we landed there. So through you, Mayor, um, there was a couple designs that were brought forward as to just, just basically to show you kind of what it would look like, uh, but the overall site plan will mostly be determined once the ground gets leveled out and a, a site plan gets put into play. We may need to move the building a couple feet here, a couple feet there. And respectfully, I think that was just a, a decision that could be kind of made on the spot when, but it, it wouldn't be um, 
you know, moving the building from one end to the other or increasing uh, other buildings to go on that site and things of that nature. This is going to be left up to the site plan. And then once the site plan is approved, essentially that's that's what it'll look like. Deputy Mayor, do you? I'm curious to learn more about the expansion in size, because in, in the report, you've said we're going to be increasing from this size to this size, but the overall building design will stay the same. So it's not that you're adding an extra bay. It's that you're, you're increasing. Is it the increase of the size to each bay and then more to the back? Like how, how would you characterize that increase? Yeah, so basically, that's exactly it, is that the, the layout of the building will still be the same. There's going to be five bays, there'll be two offices, a lunchroom, a parts room, and a bathroom. Uh, but the overall size of those rooms will increase. Um, so don't quote me on this, but I think the offices go from eight feet to 10 feet. Uh, the lunchroom, I think, adds an extra 12 feet. Um, the bays are an extra six feet wide, and I think they're an extra... 15 or 20 feet longer. Um, and this is for that storage that I was referring to. Uh, also with the way COVID and the pandemic was, uh, how we had to have more space for staff. Originally, when we put all this together, we never, we never assumed that we would need six feet between us. Um, so the additional size accommodates for future growth for staff for if we ever went back into that pandemic, we would have room to move around inside the building safely. It also uh, has really shown the amount of online training that that comes around or has come out of the pandemic and will continue to to grow that way. So looking for training space in the current building design wasn't available. This will allow us to have the lunchroom be large enough uh, to have a training, not so much a training center, but a room big enough to have a TV on the wall that could do online training or um, PowerPoints or whatever the case may be when we all get together. I, th I think that, uh, that this building and the expansion of this building was a really good example of how we really need to look to the future for, for expansion because we were no sooner done here and we needed more space and uh, you know we, we might as well do a longer term view. Deputy Mayor Dayu and then Councillor Barry. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you. And it, it did make me think that up until very recently, at least, there has been money made available for organizations that need to pivot for public safety or health and safety reasons um, related to COVID. Um, certainly private organizations, if you, if you weren't able to do your job in the confines of what you had, um, given federal and provincial um, policy on on COVID, there was money available to make those changes. And I wonder if there could be any residual money available for, for this project, because that does sound like a very good justification in addition to the storage for um, expanding the, the envelope a little bit. Through you, Mayor, uh, at this time, I have not looked into that option. Um, it's something that uh, I could spend some time on looking at for sure to see if there is something available, um, but I, I have not looked at that. Other questions? Councillor Barry. I'm um, just looking at the drawings from Tullock. Mm -hmm. um, all of the other buildings that are in here, are these are these captured in the in the in the dollars? Are these buildings to come? I'm thinking there's some round buildings, some rectangular buildings, <laughs> square buildings. I just yeah, so through you, Mayor. Um, so when that report was brought forward, uh, when I did those drawings with Tullock, we were just basically showing what the site would look like moving forward into the future. So if we were to put in a, a sand salt dome, mm -hmm. that's kind of the location of it. If we were to put in um, above ground solar, that was the idea of where the location would be. That's that's kind of what that was. And I added those reports just for your reference so that, uh, you know, in your spare time, if you were reading it up, reading up on it, you'd be able to have all that in one place. But <clears throat> we will come back with a, a new design plan it won't have those buildings in it because currently we're not looking at that as an option. Um, but that, that's, I think, to answer your question, that's what that was for back then. And it is something that needs to be considered for future development because you're going to need the space at some point. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's sort of where my question was coming from is because the truth of the matter is, is, you know, the more infrastructure and equipment that we purchase, 
if it can be stored inside, the, the longer it's going to have in lifespan. So I just wondered, looking at the drawings, which layout allows for the most protection of our equipment? So the, the layout of the building itself, is that what you're referring to or the, the property? I guess the property. So until we came, because we haven't designed, so we did increase the building uh, size until we have that approval to move forward with that. Nothing has been done with the design plan for the property. Um, you know, there is a, a, a circle there to show a sand dome. Um, and I believe the county closed a tender at the end of last year for a uh, sand salt shed that's not a, a dome it's it's a it's a new design so you know that's something that we could be looking at but all of those options are definitely on the on the thought process when it comes to laying out the building ideally it'd be nice to have the building as close to the road moved into that that corner as quick or as um, as much as possible to allow us to utilize the property and behind it um Part of the discussion today was also about the solar panel system, if we were going to move forward with solar or not. And I, I would I would like to say that if if we do or we don't, increasing the building size definitely is going to help our growth. Um, adding that extra room on to the building for a solar, whether we go today with saying, yes, we're going to do it or down the road, I still feel that we should be adding that building to it for a solar option as well as when we do do the layout of the building, whether solar panels are decided on today or at the, at the time of um, the site plan, we will still keep that in mind as an option that we have to have some room somewhere where we can add um, a solar panel system if that's the decision that we move forward with. Um, my thinking about the solar panels is that that's something that we don't necessarily have to decide right now, that it is a substantial cost. There is, you know, I, I think that there's a number of ways for us to accommodate that. In the meantime, I, I would like us to, uh, if possible, be able to see, given the changes that have taken place in solar and how, you know, how solar impacts everything, whether there's sufficient cost savings compared to the cost of installation for us to move ahead with that? Like if that's really the answer that we should be going for and, and if we need to do it now or later, because I think that's something that can be done separately. Uh, thoughts on that? Councillor Short Reed. And to have a breakdown of the solar, for the winter, you're gonna lose 80% of your solar. So how much is it gonna to cost to run the generator on the winter? Is that gonna offset it? or? because it's a new building and hopefully more efficient is a different um, path, more feasible, like LED lighting, air to air heat pump, whatever, like, I, I don't know. Because I know like with solar, like obviously things change, <laughs> but it, the initial cost is there, but there are costs throughout the years of solar too, the transformer, whatever lasts eight years, battery life might not last that long. Ravens dropping rocks on solar panels. Like there's just so many factors. Is, is there a way to break it down to show how feasible it is compared to other options? If I may, through you, Mayor, um, what I would propose then is, is that if we were moving forward with this, this design build, this garage, and we'll come back with um, uh, site layouts and things of that nature, and then allow staff to work on a solar uh, proposal or a solar report, um, but we'll keep it in mind that the building size will include that room if we should go that route. Um, and we'll keep it in mind when we're designing the land that we don't take up all of the space. You know, uh, technically where the solar panels could go could just be a, you know, an open gravel area for the time being. And this would give staff down the road some time to get this going, get this project rolling out. At the end of the day, even if the solar option was to decide today we're going to go forward with it, I would still highly recommend that a generator is put in place as well as uh, hydro. Because if we can't rely on the solar system 100%, 100% of the time, then we're not much of a public works garage if we can't get our doors up mm -hmm. because we, we don't have enough power, right? So although they do have their, their, uh, their struggles, they are obviously very efficient when they are working really well. Um, but I think it would be beneficial for staff to 
move forward with this project without solar and then uh, come back with a solar option as this project gets started and staff have more time to look into that. So we do have, <clears throat> sorry, Councilor Barry. Um, in, sorry, back to the Tullock engineering. The four alternatives is the single story with drive-through, two story with drive-through, single with no drive-through, two story with no drive-through and office space. My question is, how does that work in regards to if we go with solar, would that mean that you would need the two stories? So that you could have your storage of the equipment in the lower level and your office is upstairs, lunch upstairs. Okay, so through you, Mayor, um, it was actually decided by council that it was going to be a single story. Okay. Uh, right. That was decided by council when we first got started in this, that it was a single story, three bay drive through, two bay stationary with the office, lunchroom, and all that, that added on to it. In addition, if we were to add the solar panel system to it, it would be an additional room on the main floor off to the outside of the building um, so that all the electronics, not just the solar, but the electronics is in the building or is in that room all by itself, safe and secure, dry. The current garage that we have in Kawagama Lake, when it was built, the electrical portion of the building um, for all of the Wi-Fi, the internet, the basically everything electric is actually in a bay in the corner. Okay. And it, it, although it's on the wall, you would think it only takes up about a foot away from the wall, which is, which is correct, but we can't do anything in that bay. We can't spray anything. We can't cause too much dust. We can't cut anything just simply because it will, it will affect that, that system. So having it in its own separate room on the main floor was the idea of that. Yeah, because we, if council may recall, we we did the two story and we talked about accessibility and mm -hmm. possible stairs and what that would look like an elevator and things of that nature. And it was just a, a single story was the most efficient. So we've got two options uh, to consider with respect to solar. One is to investigate costing and the other is to not proceed with it at this time, which doesn't preclude us from at any point in time in the future going forward. So I'd like to hear um, which option council is considering? Councilor Richards. I just had a question on the um, the mechanical and electrical engineering costs. Would that include uh, planning for solar in the future? Or is that gonna be like more money to plan in the future? So through you, Mayor, uh, no, that does not include anything to do with the solar. However, the mechanical and engineering portion of it is basically what that building is going to require for electrical. Um, when it comes to the solar aspect of it, what we would need to do is take all of the electrical needs of the building and apply that to what kind of solar system we were looking at as, you know, whether that's panel or if we were to go somewhere in a different route, we need to know what that building would require. And that would be through the feasible study of that building. So the draw on it. There's a couple of reports that are attached that do speak to uh, some of that information, um, but no, it would not include anything to do with the solar other than the building itself, whether it's solar runs off a generator or runs off of uh, hydro being brought to the building is a standalone uh, power source or power system that would require power. So it would not include the solar. Councillor Shortreed and Deputy Mayor Dayu. If we, if we go with option two, will that be the option that later on when you have time, you'll look into this? Through you, yeah. Mayor, essentially through this conversation, uh, yeah, e either option would be, it would be coming back to council down the road, so. If we decided that we weren't going to pursue costing at this point in time, that doesn't preclude us at all from deciding, you know, yeah. next year or the year after that, like, hey, we, you know, we think we need to go ahead with that. And that that would land back here with us. Deputy Mayor Dayu. Given our township's commitment to climate action and reducing our fossil fuel intake as per our climate action policy, I think it would be appropriate to, to continue to cost it out, but also bearing in mind that this is, you know, the last time we talked about this at council was previous term, a few years ago, there's been a lot that's happened in the meanwhile, technology might be quite different too. There may even be, you know, and dare I say it, but instead of solar, there they might actually be something 
else out there that's competitive. And what I'm not require or requesting is that that uh, Angie direct staff to go and and you know do a whole new report on sustainable energy sources. But if there is something tickling there, I would hate for us to miss out on that because we have committed to looking at solar exclusively today. That's all. So just to keep that kind of slightly broader mind. That's not actually definitive in, in which direction, which option we choose at this point in time. My, uh, my preference is to continue to cost out solar, but also to not forget that in the last few years, there have been technological advancements. And if there is something better, then maybe to bring that to our attention for consideration. Councillor Shortreed. <clears throat> It would be nice to know actual costs, uh, but how, if everything's gone up like COVID, probably double the price of what it is on that paper. So how much are we going to spend for them to tell us it's $400,000? So you're saying option one? No, because I don't... I, I need just, to I'm know. Trying option to, one yeah, or option... No, I'm trying to justify the As cost. Lisa Berry would say, <laughs> yes or no, option one or option two. How much more are the engineers going to charge us to do that? Through you, Mayor. Um, so I would have to speak to the engineer to find out what kind of costing would come out, would, would come out of that. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't affect the project if council is approving this to move forward. It doesn't affect the building. It doesn't affect us moving forward with the project, which is which is the basis of the report. However, the solar option, it, my recommendation would be that we go with option one. And I'll just come back to council later on with options for the costing towards um, the solar option because it still need we still need to know what is going to be in the garage a feasible study on the electrical to know exactly what it is we need because I would uh, the the report I brought earlier um, in back in nineteen th did talk about what an estimated cost and we were really comparable to hydro versus solar um but you're right things have changed the building size has changed uh fuel costs we haven't even factored in the amount of fuel costs because at the time we based it on that so if solar stays the same but fuel has gone up then solar is more obtainable whereas if both have gone up there's too many factors and I think without getting too stuck in the weeds, it would make sense to go with option one. And then I'll, I'll our staff will bring back a report later uh, once we know more information. Councillor Shore Reading. Option one. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Dayu, option one. Councillor Richards. Councillor Barry. Option one, I'd like to see the engineer costs captured in that research. So you're not prepared to make a decision at this point in time because you don't know what it's going to cost us to investigate? No, I just, I think it, it's part of the cost. I'd like to know that cost included in the project. I think we're probably all going to get a big eye opener okay. here, you know, going forward. I mean, we know that we've got to do this project, but we also know that the costs are nowhere near the same, you know, for, for all of this, all aspects of it. Anyway, well, I'm hearing option one. And some decisions will be made down the road. Did you have something that you'd like to add to the discussion? I, I just want to I just want to clarify that council um, in in this discussion is prepared to make a, a decision on moving forward with the garage itself, and then a future decision on the solar. Is that what I'm hearing? Based on it cost being costed yeah. out. Yep, that's definitely. Okay. Yeah, I'm not hearing anybody say that we don't, you know, we don't want to proceed with this and and accepting the rationale that's that's been offered about additional cost size. We need to have whatever is going to serve us for some period of time. So, can I have a mover and a seconder then to move forward with this project and and uh, option one for solar? Councillors Shortreed and Barry. Moved by Councilor Short, second by Councilor Barry B. Resolved Council Receipts Report PW 923 regarding the Public Works Garage Update March 23. Submitted by Adam Thorne, dated April 20th, 2023. And that Council hereby concurs with the recommendations made in the said report to increase the size of the building to 140 feet by 
80 feet wide, 11,400 square feet, and that council authorized the engineering costs and contingency to be funded from the Public Works Roads Garage Reserve in the amount of $198,300 plus applicable tax with the contingency limit up to 15%, and that council directs staff on which sole option to proceed with option one, and further council hereby authorizes the mayor and clerk to sign any required agreement. All in favor. That's carried. You got some exciting work ahead of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I know it was a long process, but uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> So the next item, and I, I, I'm just kind of looking at the clock and wondering whether we've got sufficient time to cover this, but we'll hope that we do, um, is a discussion about the airport committee's terms of reference. And uh, I, I'm sorry to say I had made some very specific notes about uh, changes that I'd like to see, and I cannot find them. So um, my thinking, and I, I really look forward to hearing what other members of council have got. Um, first of all, I, you know, I think that I, I, I would like us to get our committees rolling as quickly as we possibly can, um, that there's some exciting things that can happen at the airport, and some of them might even be able to happen this year. Um, however, uh, a number of years ago, the, uh, the committee's name was changed from the Stanhope Municipal Airport, or I guess it was at one point in time, the Halliburton Stanhope. Um, airport co uh, committee was then changed to the Stanhope Municipal Airport Events Committee, um, and and I have always thought that that kind of did the the skills and and uh, abilities of a committee were hampered by limiting their their um, activities solely to events. That uh, we've got a lot of opportunities ahead of us with respect to the airport, and I would like to see the committee uh, once it's put in place. Uh, to have uh, you know some ability to make recommendations to council. And this is all based on recommendations to council, not making decisions on, on things like marketing, uh, development of the airport as a whole, not anything to do with operational matters because that's solely in the purview of, of our staff and, uh, and, and Adam's department. But uh, you know, I think that there might be some good thoughts and ideas that could come to the committee with respect to that. Um, we've got some very, very strong willingness by economic development and tourism to work with us um, to help us with some thoughts and ideas, not only with the, the you know, that what, what is done at the airport, but with, uh, you know, helping to discuss the, uh, the terms of reference for updating the, uh, the airport development plan. Um, so I wanted to hear what council thinks of, about that. And I, as I said, I had some specific wording that I had worked out, but uh, it's not here. Deputy Mayor Dayu. Uh, a question for you then, Madam Mayor. Would you see there being two different types of people coming on to the committee? One who are really interested in aviation and, the, and events and marketing and planes, 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 and all the great stuff we can do there. And, and another... Um, sector of individual who is interested in the development aspect and what can we do with that land and um you know where can we go economically and, and all these things and i guess my question is how are is there any risk to those two forces being on the same committee and wanting to see their piece dominate um or am i overreaching no no i don't think you are i mean um Let's hear what Adam's got to say about that. Through you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, so when we changed this around, and uh, we did put this out the first time as an events committee, there were a lot of questions uh, that I received regarding um, what exactly that was going to be. Because a lot of the calls that I got on this was, we know nothing about the airport. We know nothing about it. We know nothing about aviation, but we really like planning or we really like events. And that's where this made sense because it, it, it allowed the committee to be a part of events, but also if they had some ideas about future planning or future items, um, that was still in the purview of this committee that could be brought forward. So to answer your question from my side, from what I've heard, I think that this committee would be uh, able to do that. I think if we could really focus on getting uh, the committee started for events, 
with the thought process that we can add in that other stuff. Okay, so we've done one event. We had lots of people here. We had great ideas. What's the next thing we can do? And if that event includes, you know, looking to the future, then we have a, a committee that could do that. Um, but that was just from what I uh, witnessed when when we first changed this, is that a lot of people that were calling had no idea about aviation. And they were really confused on if they would be doing anything regarding aviation. But really, it was about bringing people to the airport, bringing events in, getting the traffic flow, getting our name out there. Um, from from my it's interesting, uh, but from my perspective, I, I you know I, I've always seen the airport as an opportunity for us, you know, for in so many different ways. Um, definitely for, for our you know economic uh, development perspective. Do we want to have a separate economic development committee that's going to look at that? I'm not sure that we're prepared to to go to that extent. I know that there have been several several people. I can't say a lot, but several people that have come forward to me that are, you know, knowledgeable about airports in all aspects, not just event planning, but also, you know, marketing and and, and literal development at the airport. Um, and uh, and I've shown an interest in being on a committee. You know, another aspect of it is that the recreation committee. I mean, uh, there was an idea brought up last night at the recreation committee about an event at the airport. Um, that that would be maybe managed by the recreation committee, and and I, like I sort of backed away from that a little bit because I while I definitely see the ability for committees to partner, and that that might be a perfect opportunity for them to partner. There are certain aspects of airport operations that are very specifically legislated, and 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 are, are just separate from anything else that that might be considered a, like an event. Um, that there has to be certain uh, considerations with respect to the operation of an airport when it comes to that. So, um, you know, I, I think we need an airport committee. I don't know about splitting it out. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can find, uh, you know, people need to know what it is we're looking for. And I think that we'll get both levels of interest. And it's like like our discussion that maybe I mean maybe I'm pie in the sky here, but you know it's like our discussion about volunteers and and I've got skills that I can do this and so I can help with this and but I've got skills that can help with that. Um, and I mean meanwhile, a lot of the airport development will land right here. Um, I just you know I I just want us to get moving. I want to see a more. Uh, responsibility given to to the committee because there were, there are so many opportunities there, um, but you know that that's why we needed this discussion. I can feel the vibrations coming. But no, okay. Um, have further thoughts. So my thought was that we you know include in the, the purpose of the committee was that that they would be able to to um, to look at marketing, to consider marketing ideas for the airport, both events and development, um, and make recommendations to council with respect to that. Um, I'm assuming that the, the staff person attached to the airport committee would be the airport coordinator um, with the ability to call on you and your levels of expertise whenever it was needed, because that, that's, that's an obvious thing. Yes, that's correct. Um, I think that uh, that there was something in here about quarterly meetings, and I definitely see the need for more frequent meetings that uh, at, at a minimum bi-monthly, if not monthly to begin with. But if we said bi-monthly and the committee meets monthly to begin with, maybe down the road bi-monthly will be good. So I'm not sure about your thoughts on, on frequency of meetings. Councillor Shortreed and then Councillor Richards. I think by month is great and i but i think till they all got their feet wet you know first nice. few maybe three months it should be monthly just so that everybody's all on the same page and you kind of got a gist of what's going on and how a meeting works and getting to know each other and then go to bi-monthly um councillor richards yeah i i agree i think monthly is is what's needed especially that it's a new committee um, bi-monthly, I could see perhaps 
much farther down the road than three months, but um, yeah, because in the winter, there's not going to be a lot going on at the airport. You, you know. never know. Well, we could change that. That's Maybe right. have a big event there. I don't um, know. Adam and then Deputy Mayor Dayu. Through your mayor. So through this terms of reference, this is essentially something that we'll have in place if the committee was a year old. So by the wording of bi-monthly or quarterly, if we're up and running and everything's going really smoothly, I, I think if we were to look at that saying that if it was um, quarterly or or every bi-monthly, whatever that may be, should we be looking at maybe some wording in there that speaks to it being brand new? So if a committee is less or a new committee with um, new members will meet monthly for the first three months, then move into, like, is there something that would be, so all I'm thinking is that if we change it to monthly and then we have a committee that's working really well for a year, do they need to meet monthly? Do they then? It may be as simple as saying monthly or as required. Yeah. Yes. And and that would cover all, all yeah. of our bases. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing uh, on uh, from my perspective is the the financing. We talked about October the 31st as sort of a, a, a date for starting to work on what's coming for the following year that uh, that we should probably stick with the same date for, for all of the committees with respect to that. Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you? Did you want to include in the purpose some delicately worded reference to input into the uh, the airport development study or something which shows that we're interested in in their thoughts and ideas and maybe getting involved in surveys? I mean, I have no idea, but not necessarily looking for leadership on what can happen in that area. The leadership of that study would go to the professionals in economic development. But, but they're welcome to offer fruits. Um, I, I think, I mean, that would be the ultimate in, in how we would go forward, that they'd have that ability. I'm not sure that the timing is good for that. Uh, by the time that we advertise for and, and get members in place based on, you know, how we want to move forward with getting the, the study done. Um, to me, I, I think that that may be more at this point in time, more of a council discussion. And, and I think that, you know, I've, I've talked with uh, the CAO a little bit about uh, bringing uh, Scott Ovell in from the county, who's more than willing to to uh, to give us some of his thoughts and ideas about what we might include in, in the RFP or what we might be looking for um, that would address economic development. Um, that's just kind of my thinking. How does that sound to you? I think you're absolutely correct. I, I know that one of the things that will likely happen um, through that the update of the plan is that uh, any consultant will um, interview the members. Um, I know that did happen the last time. So that can be sort of um, their involvement in the process. Yeah. So um, I I guess what would happen is that um, our, our trustee scribe has written down the thoughts that we've had and uh, we would bring back a, a draft, the draft or terms of reference for our next meeting. So do we require a resolution at all at this point? Okay, could I have a mover and a seconder that staff proceed as, as directed? Councillors Richards and Barry. by Councillor Richards, second by Councillor Barry, be it resolved Council direct staff to bring back a revised terms of reference for the airport committee for further consideration. All in favor. That's carried. Uh, I know it's a couple of minutes past 12. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, I think uh, that we probably have enough time to, uh, to hear the chief's report um, and that will set you free for the day and, and we can carry on with the rest of the agenda after lunch. Sure. Morning, Morning Mayor Chief. And Council. Morning. A couple of highlights that I have in this uh, activity report for last month. We had uh, one major fire on Wren Lake. It involved the use of all three departments. And the nice thing about it is all three departments, they responded as one and they worked as one. The, the crews are interoperated amongst each other, 
and is really, really effective. Unfortunately, when we were called for the fire on Wren Lake, it was noticed by a neighbor, so it was fully involved. We had no possibility of ever saving that structure, but the next house was only about 10 feet away, so their efforts did save the, the additional residents next to it. So it was a long day and night for them, but they did a great job. So that was our one highlight. The second highlight is Station 70 now has their Zodiac. It's in service if needed, but our ideal thing, as soon as the water level is maintained at a more constant level than it is right now, they're going to start doing their in-service training with it. So uh, I think it's a real positive. Now all three departments, or I shouldn't say departments, all three stations do have a, some type of marine response capabilities. So uh, I think it's a really good thing going forward. And I think they're quite deserving the morale of the department up there. Getting it is really good for that. So. Um. Yeah, you don't have to talk to me about the uh, the excitement of having a Zodiac for use. They're terrific uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, any questions on uh, on the chief's report? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the report? Uh, Councillors Short Reed and Deputy Mayor Day. Moved by Councillor Short Reed, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dayu. Be it resolved, Council receives report FD623 regarding monthly activity submitted by Michael French, dated April 20th, 2023, and the Council accepts with regret the resignation of Mike Rogers, Station 60, effective March 9th, 2023. All in favor? That's carried. And with your indulgence, the uh, finance reports are reasonably uh, uh, short, so uh, I, I think we'll uh, we'll offer the same. Uh, opportunity to Jeannie as we did the chief. Thanks, chief. So your first is your financial summary. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you. This is just the uh, first quarter summary for the financial summary for 2023. And as it indicates that uh, we've incurred 13.87, 14% of our annual operating expenses to date and received about 28% of our budgeted revenues to date. So we're in line, um, notably the operating expenditures because of the, when we actually pass the budget, the spending doesn't start right at the beginning of the year, but they will be ramping that up over the next few weeks, months, and as, as also with the season change as well. So you'll see a change in the, in the expenditures in the, the next quarter, so. Other than that, we're, we're in good shape. Any questions on the financial summary? Hearing none, could I have a mover in a second or two receive it? Councillors Richards and Barry. Moved by Councillor Richards, second by Councillor Barry. Be it resolved, Council receives report TT1223, submitted by Jean Hughes, dated April 20th, 2023, regarding revenues and expenditures to the end of the first quarter of 2023. All in favor? That's carried. And next is your account summary. Again, uh, the first quarter levies are included in the summary, hence why it looks a little higher than a normal quarter or a normal month. But other than that, there's just your standard expenditures in that report. Any questions? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the account summary? Councilor Sh Short Reed and Barry. By Councillor Short Reed, second by Councillor Barry B. Resolved Councillors reviewed the expenditures incurred as set out in the account summary report TT 1323 in the total amount of $2,366,412.17 and hereby approves payment as same. All in favor. That's carried. Thank, Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Thank you. And we will now uh, break for lunch.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're going to make a, uh, a slight amendment to the agenda and deal with um, correspondence now, um, as our treasurer would like to speak to the Essex uh, letter or, or request regarding retaining surplus proceeds from tax sales. If that's all right with members of council. So if you could speak to that, uh, please, Madam Treasurer. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, it, it's it's a letter from actually Plimpton, Wyoming, in response to a town of assets motion in reference to the surplus proceeds of tax sales. Um, prior to 2018, when mm -hmm. a tax sale process was done, we would the municipality would pay the proceeds into the courts, and then after a year, if the proceeds remain unclaimed, we could petition the report the courts to get the proceeds back to the municipality. As of 2018, uh, new legislation was passed that uh, now we are no longer able to apply for the surplus funds ever. Under the new payment of court provisions, persons claiming uh, entitlement to funds must apply between 90 days and 10 years after a tax sale has completed. <laughs> And um, if no one makes an application or there are funds remaining in the court after 10 years, they are deemed forfeited to the Crown. So having said that, um, it is my recommendation that Council follow along with the Town of Flinton, Wyoming uh, and Essex in, in supporting a motion to uh, change back to the former legislation, which would allow those proceeds of tax sales to come back to the municipality. Because these are lands for sale of our municipality. I mean, the private lands, but if the situation, we get our tax monies out of it, but the yeah, other monies would definitely help to support the municipality going forward. Deputy Mayor, do you? So then we are, it is expected that we will assume the costs of the tax sale and get none of that recovered? That portion is recovered that through the tax recovered. sale process. Okay. So okay. It, our costs are covered and our taxes are covered. It's the proceeds from those sales that we are now relinquishing to the courts. Uh, Councillor Richards. Just for my clarity, it, so the proceeds would normally go to the landowner? The proceeds are paid into the court, if you may. Um, they're pro after the tax sales completed, they're paid into the courts. And then a landowner or any person who has um, is on application or on title of the land has up to a year to redeem those from the courts. They can apply for to petition those after that time frame. In normal cases, then the municipality, if they remain on claim prior to 2018, the municipality could then file to the courts and actually the proceeds would come back to the municipality. Mm -hmm. Now, the landowner and, and anybody entitled <clears throat> within the property can do that, but the municipality has no, no way of petitioning for those funds. Okay. Any other questions about that? Uh, could I then have a mover and a seconder to support Jeannie's recommendation? Deputy Mayor and Dayu, Councillor Richards. By Deputy Mayor Dayu, seconded by Councillor Richards, be it resolved that Council supports the Town of Essex Resolution R23381 regarding the reinstatement of previous legislation that permitted a municipality to apply for and retain the surplus proceeds from a tax sale in their jurisdiction. And further, a copy of this resolution be forwarded to the Premier of Ontario, Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister of Finance, MPP, and Association for Municipalities of Ontario. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank Much you. Much appreciated. Um, was there anyone who wished to support the, any of the other correspondence? Um, not hearing any, could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the correspondence, the remaining correspondence? Deputy Mayor Dayu, Councillor Richards. Mm 
Moved by Deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councilor Richards. Be it resolved, Council receives the April 20, 2023 correspondence listing for information. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, so next is the administration business. First is the Stanhope Museum Committee update. Who wants to speak to that? So this is our second meeting that we've met. And um, <laughs> this is our second meeting and um, it was a good meeting. We had the clerk come, actually, I think it's our deputy clerk come to give information on the manual and there's work being done in regards to volunteer outreach for the museum hosts. And there's been a good uptick since, since this meeting. So we have another one, maybe two hosts. So it looks like our museum will be covered for the summer. And um, the plan is that the museum will open on July 1st. And then we'll, and then we'll remain open until um, Labor Day. And then after Labor Day, it will just be Saturdays until the end of, I think the 23rd of September. And we're not going to be doing Heritage Day proper here, but instead we're going to be doing some heritage events within the community and um, sort of partnering with a couple other organizations such as the Library and High Caliber. And so you'll see something coming forward in the next meeting minutes, but um, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, has there been a decision made that Heritage Day is no longer, or or is it you know there, because we could maybe look at some point in the future having um, a, a smaller version of Heritage Day, or I'm not sure the, about the viability. So there has there been any sort of overriding expression? I don't think it's been decided that it will never happen again. I think just right now, the focus is on doing some more work within the collections and um, bringing people into the museum throughout the season, opposed to that one day. So. Um, okay, I, I just one thing that uh, based on earlier discussion that we had about volunteers, you might want to at the next meeting float the idea of of you know a, a broader view of, of volunteers. Let them know that we will be having a discussion about that in the future and any thoughts that they've got that they you know want to throw into the, the pot of ideas about how we approach that which might be a good idea. Any questions or comments then about Stanhope Museum? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder to accept the minutes? Councillor Short Reed, Councillor Richards, thank you. Moved by Councillor Short Reed, second by Councillor Richard Deer resolved that Council receives the March 20th, 23 Stanhope Museum Committee meeting minutes for information. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, next up is the Dorset Museum. Um, I can speak to that. It's a while ago now. Um, they too are preparing to open for the season. Um, one of the things that came forward, I guess this would be a discussion for council, was there was a discussion at the, at the meeting in regards to a lot of people that are coming are asking if they can bring their dogs into the museum. And I said that would have to be supported by council, but maybe there'd be an area outside of the building where said dog could wait for people. Um, yeah, thank you for raising that because that's something that I would have brought up too. Uh, I mean, I, I understand the whole service dog is uh, is one thing, but um, you know, bringing dogs into a museum where there's um, you know sensitive material and material that needs to be protected and archived, and you know, I just don't see that as being a place for dogs. Um, I, I don't see them developing a space inside. Um, if if there's some thoughts or suggestions about an outside space, little covered shelter, something, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. There, there are some ramifications with that because there's a, you know, a bit of the poop and scoop aspect of it. But, uh, you know, I, I look to council for thoughts about 
that suggestion. Deputy Mayor Dayu. Sadly, it only takes one incident for that to be a major regret of letting dogs inside. So I, I don't think I could support that. But but certainly I'm sure the you know the the committee would have an idea on you know, is there a little area where we could put a little piece of shade if there isn't already sh enough shade on the side of the building. Um I I'd have to look at it again through the, that lens, but um, um you know, a little a little hand painted sign welcoming the pooches to the you know there's there's ways. There are ways of making it a welcoming thing. And I, I'm not sure about poop and scoop in that, in my dog ownership experience, the dogs often do that when they're walking out and not when they're, you know, in a space. So uh, maybe that wouldn't be as much of an issue, maybe. Well, I mean, it's just something that needs to be thought about. Definitely. Like, I mean, if there's, if, if people think, oh, great, like right on, they've made it a dog friendly place and I don't want it not to be. But, um, you know, that, that maybe encourages more people to bring their dogs and adds, Another layer could add another layer because there's there's no predicting how that might happen. Um, other thoughts, Councillor Richards, then Councillor. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Um, I think it would be nice to make sort of all of our public outdoor spaces dog friendly with poop and scoop stations, perhaps, but. <clears throat> that's another discussion and uh i don't think inside the museum is appropriate so if they want to discuss and bring forth ideas for outside area that's something that we would still have to consider um did you have a comment councillor short i'm just curious did they have a lot of requests for people to bring their dogs in you no i think there was maybe three incidents last year where someone wanted to come in but they had to take turns with their partner and it was suggested. And I think already they do offer like, like a watering station outside for the animals, which I think is fine, but it was more like, but there could be a designated area where you could tie up your dog. There's covered porches on both sides of the building. I think that's suffice. lots of room. Yeah. So, so uh, you'll have to bring that back. Yep. Okay. Any other questions about the museum's update in minutes? Can I have a mover and a seconder to receive the minutes? Councillor Short Reed, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Moved by Councillor Short Reed, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dayu. Be it resolved that Council receives the March 28, 2023 Dorset Museum Committee meeting minutes for information. All in favor? That's carried. The next item on the agenda is the health and wellness spending account policy. Welcome, Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm excited to be back again. Uh, as you, as Council can recall, in February, we brought a report that we were applying for the uh, Employment Insurance Premium Reduction Program. Um, and at that point, we needed to have some direction on how we were going to return the savings to the staff. And so with very excited news, we have formed, we have received our formal approval. Um, and so at the time, we were going to table a policy to be brought forward once we received that. So I have, we have a, a health and wellness spending account policy put forward for Council's consideration today. And are there questions about what's being proposed. Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive and approve the policy? Uh, Councillor, did I see your hand, Councillor Barry? Um, Councillor Shortreed, it, it was a flash. <laughs> Moved by Council Berry, second by Council Short Read. Be it resolved, Council receives report DC 223 regarding the health and wellness spending account submitted by Sarah Hudson, dated April 20th, 2023, and the Council concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and authorizes the implementation of a health wellness spending account 
for all full-time employees effective January 1st, 2023 to be continually funded from the Employment Insurance Premium Reduction Program and further that a bylaw to adopt the health wellness spending account be brought forward. All in favor, that's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your work on that. Hello, Mr. O'Callaghan. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. So the first item on your list of items is the uh, minutes from the Committee of Adjustments. Uh, yes, unless there's any questions. Um... Any questions? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the Committee of Adjustment minutes? Councillor Short Reed and Richards. by Councillor Short Reed, second by Councillor Richards, <clears throat> be it resolved that the March 31st, 2023 Committee of Adjustment meeting minutes be received as for information. All in favor? That's carried. Um, unfortunately, we have received a resignation from one of our Committee of Adjustment members, uh, that being um, Chris Woods, who, uh, you know, we appreciate the amount of time that he's spent on the committee. He's He's been on it for a number of years and was a a valuable member of the committee, um, and we're sorry to see him leave. Um, one of the things that we have always liked to see is representation from across the municipality. Um, and Mr. Woods was suggesting that he knew several people in the municipality or in that community that might be interested in continuing. So he was going to kind of put the word out and see you know, who we could find. Um, in the meantime, I'm not sure if we want to leave it at that and see what, what he comes back with or if we want to formally put out a, uh, um, <clears throat> a call for members. Thoughts? Councillor Richards? I, I think we should go ahead with putting out a call for members, see who comes in, as well as, you know, continuing to see where this goes. Deputy Mayor Dayu. Would there be anything precluding us from putting out a call for members and specifying we're looking for folks from this region of the township because we're amply covered in the other region? Well, that would definitely be something that I'd like to see. I, you know, um, I've got to say that, uh, that when I talked to Chris, um, he said that he knew several people that were interested. And I think he was a little concerned that he would, you know, get somebody enthused about being a member um, and, and then through a call for membership, those people that he had spoken to would be turned down. Um, so I, I don't know if one would work against the other, but, uh, you know, I, I think that that maybe is the is a better uh, sort of midpoint approach to, uh, to specifying that we're looking for someone from the Oxton Lake or northern um, <coughs> part of the municipality. Did you, um, go ahead. Yeah, would it be Ward 1 or 3, perhaps, because that covers Dorset and Oxton Lake, or is there someone already from Dorset? No, uh, it could be for either ward. Okay. Um, I, Sean, did you have a comment that you wanted to make about that at all, or any recommendations or thoughts? Uh, I was just going to seek clarification as well as on which specific wards we should be uh specifying the applicant should come from. So I think that's clear now. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we should probably include the fact that whether they come from from Ward 1 or 3, that, that, that we're looking for someone to kind of cover, although they're responsible for all applications across the municipality, that we're looking for somebody that, that's going to, you know, sort of represent the northern part of. Okay, so uh, could we have a resolution, a mover and a seconder to move forward with advertising in that area? Deputy Mayor Dayu, Councillor Short Reed. By Deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councillor Short Reed, be it resolved, Council acknowledges with regret the resignated, resignation of Chris Woods from the Committee of Adjustment and the Council directs staff to advertise for one public member or the committee from Ward 1 or Ward 3. All in favor? That's carried. Um, and also, I wonder if we can ask that a, a letter of thanks and appreciation could be prepared. That'd be great. 
So on to your next items of planning business. The first is a proposed right away by McDonald. Yes, this is a proposed application to establish a right of way over a private piece of property. Um, this application was originally before council as a lot addition in March of last year. And after further survey work was completed, it was determined a, a right of way would also be established. So that's why it's back before council today. Um, staff are supportive of the proposal with some uh, suggested conditions as contained in my report and I'm happy to answer any questions should council have any. Um, any questions on the application? You say I, I found the uh, the mapping a little bit confusing about exactly where the right of way was, but I'm I, I'm not concerned about it. It's just, it is a, an oddly configured uh, piece of land. So. Yeah, it certainly is. Could I have a mover and a seconder then to uh, approve that application? Uh, Councillors Barry, Deputy Mayor Dayu. By Council Barry, second by Deputy Mayor Dayu, be it resolved, Council receives report PL 2623 prepared by Sean O'Callaghan and dated April 20th, 2023, regarding proposed severance of lands located at part of lot 17, concession 12, geographic township of Sherburne, McDonald, submitted by EJ Williams Surveying Limited on behalf of Janice McDonald, and further that Council supports in principle the proposed right of way subject to the following conditions one, payment of taxes, including penalty and interest and to a copy of the draft reference plan be submitted to the planner of the Township of Algonquin Highlands for review and comment prior to the registration of the plan. All in favor. That's carried. Um, I wonder if we could move to item G while uh, Councillor short -Reed is out of the room and she doesn't have to leave twice. Yes, that's a good idea. So that's a proposed road allowance closing by um, RNF Muland Limited. Yes, this road allowance, it's uh, the property is better known, known as the uh, Dorset Timber Mart uh, property. So there is a road allowance running between uh, that property and a parcel of land directly south of that, which they also own. Um, so they are proposing to close the road allowance. Um, staff have reviewed the, the proposal and um, are supportive of it. One thing to note is our policy is generally not supportive of closing a road allowance when it leads to water. However, there is an, uh, an exception within that policy where a road allowance uh, leads to water and from water, uh, consideration can be given to, to close that. So uh, staff are supportive of the application and happy to answer any questions should council have any. Well, it would look to me like um, with access to that road allowance through Trading Bay Road, that there still is if somebody needed to use the road allowance to get to the water, they still could, even though we close that section. Yes. So that kind of alleviates the concern in my mind. Any questions about that application? Can I have a, um, you had a question, Councillor Barry? Go ahead. Yeah. Is it is it normal? I just, I think this is the first application that I can remember or rec remember seeing where the property goes over a waterway. Is that, is that like the, so it, it, to me, it looks like there's a portion of the water that is owned, and I didn't, I didn't think we could own water. I thought we could own up to the water, but it's it's likely a a mapping error just with the GIS overlay over onto to the map. But also in some cases, um, especially on Kawagama where lands have been flooded, um, they may own the land underneath the water. But now that it's flooded land, it's, it's still technically part of the crown. Okay, thank you. Good point, though. Um, could I have a mover and a second to move forward with this application? Councillor Richards and Deputy Mayor Dayu. Moved by Councillor Richards, second by Deputy Mayor Dayu. Be it resolved, Council receives report PL 3023 regarding proposed road allowance closing between lot three, concession 12 and 13, geographic township of Sherburne. RNF Moonland Limited, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated April 20th, 2023, and the council approves in principle application RA123 made to stop up close and convey a portion of the road allowance between lot three, concession 12 and 13, geographic township of Sherburne. And the applicants are requested to proceed in accordance with the road allowance closing procedure. All in favor? That's carried. Could you invite Councillor Shortley back?
So we've def dealt with both applications. All right, so next is the uh, proposed short word allowance closing by Rod Mel. Uh, yes, this is a, a bylaw to close the short road allowance. So it was originally approved in principle by council in January of 2022. Um, the application has been circulated to all commenting agencies as well as to adjacent property owners and no objections have been received or easements requested. Uh, so staff would recommend approval of the proposed bylaw. Any questions? Can I have a mover and a seconder then to uh, approve the proposed bylaw? Councillors Barry and Richards. Moved by Councilor Barry, second by Councilor Richards. B. Resolve Council receives report PL 2723 regarding proposed shore road allowance closing running property located in a part of Lot 1, Concession 8, Geographic Township of Sherburne, Rodmel, Raven Lake, submitted by Shauna Callahan, dated April 20th, 2023. And the Council deems the said shore road allowance to be surplus and concurs with the recommendation made in this report and directs a bylaw to stop up closing of A. The said shore road allowance be brought forward for further consideration. All in favor? It's carried. Next is uh, another proposed short road allowance closing by Squire and Stano. Yes, this is uh, another bylaw to close the short road allowance in front of this property on Halls Lake. Uh, it was originally approved in principle uh, in May of last year. Uh, again, it was circulated to all the uh, commenting agencies as well as neighboring property owners and no objections have been received. So staff would recommend approval of the proposed bylaw. Any questions? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a second or to approve it? Deputy Mayor Dayu, Councilor Short Reed. By Deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councilor Short Reed. Be it resolved, Council receives report PL 2823 regarding proposed shore road allowance closing, running property located at part of lot 11, concession 9, geographic township of Stanhope, Squire, Halls Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated April 20th, 23. And the council deems a said short road allowance to be surplus and concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and directs a bylaw to stop up closing of A. The said short road allowance be brought forward for further consideration. All in favor? That's carried. And finally, another proposed short road allowance closing um, by 80 and mirrorless on Kawagama Lake. Yes, thank you. This uh, again is another bylaw to close the short road allowance in front of this property. Um, it was approved in principle in uh, July of 2022 uh, by council and again circulated to all their commenting agencies and neighboring property owners. Uh, no objections received or easements requested. Uh, so staff are recommending approval of the bylaw. Any questions? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to approve the bylaw? Councillors Short Reed and Barry. Moved by Councillor Short Reed, second by Councillor Barry B. Resolved Council receives report PL 2923 regarding proposed shore road allowance closing fronting property located at part of lot 27, concession 14, geographic township of Sherburn, ED and Marilis, Quagamaw Lake, submitted by Sean O'Callaghan, dated April 20th, 2023. And the Council deems the said shore road allowance to be surplus <coughs> and concurs with the recommendation made in the said report and directs a bylaw to stop up close to convey the said shore road allowance be brought forward for further consideration. All in favor. That's carried. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. And next is uh, our reports on external boards and agencies. Uh, first up is the Dorset Community Partnership. Anything to report, Councillor Shortreed? That was last council, so we don't have one for another couple of months. For that, um, for the hub, that is next week. Well, we look forward to that. Um, is there been any discussion about uh, a representative from the hub coming to speak to council at all? About I've, there. I was going to talk about it. This is the first um, hub meeting that I'll. Into. Okay. I haven't had one yet. So. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Getting ahead of myself. Um, Councilor Richards, anything on Upper Trent Water Management Partnership? Uh, the first meeting for the upper trend is tomorrow. So I'll let you know next time. And you're excited about your first meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and the uh, the watershed hasn't met since the last meeting. Um, but 
uh, you may be aware they have asked for a delegation in July to come to us. So. Okay, thank you. Just to inform us, or did you know that they have an ask? I think they're coming to ask for some funding huh? and inform us. Well, we look forward to the information. Yes. <laughs> um, Community Policing Advisory Committee has not yet met, but we're going to meet next week, next Friday, which uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to. We really need, uh, we've got a lot of issues. So if there's anything that uh, that tweaks anybody's mind that they'd like brought up at a Community Policing and Advisory Committee meeting, let me know. Um, and I'll bring uh, information back at the next meeting. I think that we've all heard uh, everything that we need to hear from Eorn today. I don't think that there's any other information that I could possibly add to, uh, to that today. Anything that you'd like to bring to our attention uh, from the library? Yeah, um, we had a good meeting last week, I suppose, in the beautiful sunshine. Uh, for which, of course, I was dressed in a full coat and boots because it was still a, a meter of snowpack <laughs> up near us, but that's beside the point. <laughs> um, some, a couple of interesting developments. Number one, in June, the library board is going to be doing a, a tour of all the library facilities in Halliburton, which I think can only be good for Algonquin Highlands um, because we have one library where others have more or better equipped or whatever it might be. So I think there can only be good things coming from that. Um, there's also an interesting uh, uh, pilot that the board has agreed to um, to begin interlibrary loan services with a large municipality down in the south where we do have a lot of, um, so from whence a lot of seasonal residents hail to see how, how it might work if we had that longer distance interlibrary loan agreement um, with potentially more um, back and forths uh, with with those services. So it's it's going to be more of an experiment to see how much it costs, whether it takes a lot more staff time, whether we like it, because if we can make it work, then there is interesting scope for doing that with other major centers, uh, facilitating the ease of library services for all of our taxpayers, uh, which would be a good thing. So there, there there's going to be a close eye kept on that. Um, any uh, any I thought about impact or the the cost of of shipping and books back and forth? Um, I didn't get any numbers from the meeting. Uh, obviously, they've got there is a known um, calculation for that because interlibrary loan services have been shipped in the last few years rather than having a van go through. So somewhere in there, there is an there is an understood set of uh, costs. Um, I just, I don't know what they are, but like, that's, that'll more. be part of the consideration. I'm sure, oh yeah, no doubt. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? That's it for library. Have, I just, uh, have they received encouragement to, uh, to give a little boost to Stanhope mm -hmm. as far as hours and or programs? There seems to be a very set system for offering programs across the, uh, uh, you know, across the, the library facilities. So it doesn't appear that this stage in the calendar is the moment to add more things because things are, are planned for months and months and months out. I think when we do our visits, it would be uh, in June, it would be a really interesting time to talk about what are the sorts of programming that has been billed for Stanhope and what the scope might be for more and while, when people are there. Even if it's not a, a, additional programs, uh, like I, additional hours. I mean, this is something that has been suggested to the board and staff for months and months and months that, right. you know, that we'd been, you know, sort of out of the picture for a number of reasons. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of emphasis putting into additional hours in Highlands East, right. who have four branches, at right. least. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just seemed that a little more emphasis could be paid to, uh, yeah. to Stanhope and Algonquin Highlands yeah, as a whole. Much. Now we, we do look forward to, you know, working out a, a, a new collaborative approach for Dorset. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. You know, and on that, there are some, dare I say, exciting technological advances in library services, including locker systems, which are a bit more dynamic. Um, 
uh, and timed entries into certain spaces within buildings that that could allow a, a better offering of library services without the additional staff time, all the time required to be there to open the doors. And um, uh, it's a direction that I think is excellent for rural communities such as ours, especially up in Algonquin Islands. And I'm really keen to see and take part of in the conversation of what could this mean for Dorset? What could it mean for, for Stanhope to make sure that, that if in, in our desire to increase our hours, we're doing it in a way that is dynamic and fresh um, and will actually draw people to the service. And in a way that that is is um, user friendly for all, absolutely. Uh, because there's still, you know, we we talked about things last night at the rec committee that was acknowledged that you know some seniors just are not techno friendly. Right, right. So we need to think about that. Um, oh my gosh, there was another question I wanted to ask about uh, about library services. Oh, I know, I did want to comment that. I know that there have been concerns raised in Dorset about the lockers and the condition of the lockers and a little bit of rusting. And um, there are solutions to that yeah. that, uh, that that will be uh, put in place. So, yeah. you know, that won't be an ongoing concern. Yeah, thanks and I was that. very, very happy to see the uh, receptiveness of the new owners of Robinson's to continue on for now. It's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, community safety and well-being. Anything that to impart there? Meetings coming up in May, early May. Okay. And anything on the Muskoka River watershed communications? I suppose only to say that they're definitely doing their job. You know, they they said we've got a ton of snowpack, and if we have precipitation and heat, we're going to get some localized flooding. And here we are. We've had some some challenges over the, you know, across the county and, and certainly in that watershed. So it's it's nice to see that the information system lines up with the lived reality. Yeah. And thank you for sending out the reports that you do. Okay. Um, there's, I think maybe we need to take this item off the agenda because there is no longer a, a Climate. Community Climate Action Plan Advisory Group. Well, that may be replaced by a different group at some point in time, but for now, there's they're not in existence. Uh, so next on the agenda is the request uh, for um, support for membership on the uh, Kawartha Conservation um, protection committee. Can I have a mover and a seconder to uh, support that recommendation? Councillor Shortreed, Councillor Barry. By Councillor Shortreed, second by Councillor Barry. Be it resolved, the Township of Algonquin Highlands endorses the City of Kawartha Lake Supervisor Policy Planning Paul Pekinen as the Kawartha Halliburton Municipal Representative on the Trent Conservation Coalition Source Protection Committee. All in favor? It's carried. Is there any notice of motion? Okay. Oh, it says right there. But that doesn't preclude somebody from saying at the last minute. Would it? Yes, in our procedural bylaw, if a member wishes to bring forward a motion, they would contact me in advance and we would put it on the agenda to give notice for the next regular council meeting. Okay. We've done the correspondence listing. We have no closed session. So therefore no report from closed. So we're um, into the bylaws section. So could I have a mover and a seconder to approve the bylaws? Councillor Shortreed, Councillor Richards. Moved by Councillor Shortreed. Second by Councillor Richards, be it resolved the following bylaws be received and read a first time, consider read a second and third time, and finally pass with the corporate seal affixed. Bylaw 2023-29 to appoint municipal law enforcement officer for the Township of Algonquin Highlands. Bylaw 2023-30 to stop up close convey part of original shore road allowance lying in front of part of lot one, concession eight, geographic township of Sherburne, Rodmel. Bylaw 2023-31 to stop up close convey 
part of the original shore road allowance lying in front of part 11 concession nine geographic township of stanhope squire 2023 to stop up closing of a part of the original shore road allowance lying in front of part of lot 27 concession 14 geographic township of sherburn ed uh 2023 33 to adopt a health and wellness spending account policy and 2023 11 as amended to provide for maintaining land in a clean clear and safe condition all in favor that's carried and could i have a mover and a seconder to uh approve the confirming bylaw deputy mayor dayu councillor richards moved by deputy Mayor Dayu, second by Councilor Richards, be it resolved that bylaw 2023-34, being a bylaw confirmed the proceedings of council, be received and read a first time, considered read a second and third time, and finally passed with a corporate seal affixed. All in favor? That's carried. And finally, could I have a motion to adjourn? Councilor Short read, Deputy Mayor Dayu. Moved by Councilor Short read, seconded by Deputy Mayor Dayu, be it resolved council meeting is hereby adjourned at 1.31 p.m. All in favor, that's carried. Thank you everyone.